Transmissions. And hello, Abstract Transmissions listeners. Thank you for listening. And I want to welcome today KK Eden um, for coming on the show. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you for having uh, me. KK Eden is a um, author uh, of um, The Measurements of Decay, uh, which is a fantastic novel. And that's how I uh, came across him. So again, yeah, thanks for coming on. Um, uh, how's uh, how is the uh, holidays for you? Um, not too bad. Uh, quiet. At yeah. Home, mostly. Quarantine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, everything's fine. How about yourself? Uh, not bad. Not bad. We same thing. Just kind of stuck around the house. Um, I think most people's plans just kind of went uh, went south uh, in the uh, in um, observance of COVID nineteen. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, yeah. No. I. Um, <laughs> I really am glad that you came on just because I've, I, I dig into this stuff often and I feel like for some guests, it's not necessarily a topic that they're, uh, you know, into digging into, or it's something that they're just not as familiar with. Um, and after reading the book, uh, there's just, there's so much there. Uh, so for the re- the uh, listeners uh, out there that are not familiar with the, the novel, it's a, well, I'll let you explain. <laughs> Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, so it's a it's a science fiction novel, um, although I, I guess it's sort of atypical in the sense that it's uh, very it's very heavily influenced by philosophy, but also integrates uh, philosophy uh, to a large extent. Uh, mainly because the um, I'd say the main character, the narrator, is uh, a sort of twisted uh, evil <laughs> philosopher. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't know how much we want to get into into spoilers or. Anything. Sure. So no. I'll and I was worried about that too, because uh, yeah. I. I mean, there's a lot of things I want to unpack, uh, but at the same time, I want to be careful to kind of uh, not ruin it, because the the book has a really good ending, um, in my opinion, and and I think that's hard for a lot of authors to to get right. Um, and uh, so I just want to say personally, I really like the ending of the book. Um, oh, thank you. I, I appreciate uh, that. It embodies the whole thing. It tie, it tie, it wraps it up really well, in my opinion. Um, nice. And I, uh, I I think the thing that I really liked was the perspectives, um, the varying perspectives between CL and uh, Tikan and 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 um, and then I mean how she's kind of I don't want to go too much into it, but uh, kind of moving through the different timelines. Um, mm-hmm. uh, what I found to be really interesting um, and kind of uh, again, kind of giving away a little bit of the book, but it, I think it's really important to kind of dig into, especially where everybody right now is just kind of, I'm not going to say asleep, right? But everybody is just so wrapped up in, you know, this digital reality versus mm-hmm. real reality. Um, and that's just, I think, a really good um I guess, uh, perspective in the book that I don't, I'm not sure if that was the goal uh, initially, but really gives me the, uh, the intense feeling of just, of just, it's depressing. You know what I mean? That the, the, the mm-hmm. sheer just sadness of people wrapped up in these virtual realities that there's just no reason to want to step out of it. And it's not necessarily that they're happy about it or that it's super euphoric. It's that it's mm-hmm. just another type of reality not their own. Mm. But the, and, but there is a pull in some sense. There's a a, a kind of uh, attraction, whether at the end or not. There's a, any kind of meaning or pleasure or, or whatever derived from it. Um, I, I do think that there's a kind of uh, uh, maybe addiction isn't the right word, but a kind of uh, a feeling that one must engage. Yeah. In that kind of yeah. Well, and I would say you know almost and not so much. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, not so much a a um, an ad- addiction but like a compulsion right because it's like that's the word i was looking for they're they're so uh wrapped up in um in this you know reality that they don't know anything other than if i'm correct Mm -hmm. right i mean that's just kind of been it for them forever and Mm -hmm. you know the you know um the one character without this device called the procrustis am i pronouncing that's right right? um and it it that the interesting thing is it's, um, you know, it's very similar to the Neuralink in, in, in some ways, obviously, there's obviously <laughs> some differences yeah, sure. there uh, and technolo- technological variants, <laughs> uh, <laughs> definitely a big difference. Uh, but I think it's, it's almost kind of creepy in a way because I really see this um, being a very, you know, not to, you know, prop it up too much, but I think 
it's very, uh, very much sci-fi in the vein that, how do I word this? Authors like Asimov, authors like um, Heinlein, uh, they, they, they foresaw a future that hadn't existed yet, but it isn't far off from where we are now. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I yeah. just kind of feel like that very much uh, is the case of this book. And I mean, who knows, right? But um, yeah, I mean, I, I sincerely uh, hope not. But <laughs> yeah, but I, uh, I, I Me mean, too. that is sort of is sort of what um, I mean. In some sense, like, so I I don't know too much about the Neuralink. I I've had a like a sort of brief like Wikipedia look at it, and I also watched the um, like the I think there was a recent presentation that Elon Musk did with with some people, there were like pigs involved and they were showing, uh, you know, how it works uh, to some extent. And um, it, it was interesting to me because, yeah, yeah, like you said, I mean, it's very much like kind of a prototype uh, version of what, whatever uh, I have in my novel. And there was something kind of sinister at the end of, of his presentation where uh, they asked like, so what's this for? You know, what's the purpose of this uh, device which, you know, can effectively, uh, you know, at, at, at first read your brain, but also influence, you know, the, the connection between your brain and the outside world in a way that, uh, that seems some, could be invasive, right? Absolutely. And, uh, and the, the, uh, the initial response was like, well, it's to, it's to help people with like, you know, uh, who have um, spinal cord injuries or, or disabilities. Or, or, and, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and of course that's like a noble, like, uh, you know, a goal, but that's sort of, you know, a, a reason or a justification given that's hard to argue with you can is this, well don't you want to help you know right uh, people. right it makes but it then, really and then at the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah it makes it really then, hard to argue with and then you feel like the asshole if you're arguing it but i i agree yeah but then at the at the end and it's like or maybe even just a few minutes later um there were questions from the audience and someone says uh can this be used to save and replay memories and uh he just says yeah <laughs> like or oh, maybe just, not it maybe just <laughs> maybe yeah not this version but like you know at some point uh, some future uh, version of it and uh, and it's like what does that have to do with helping you know people who have uh, uh, you know spinal cord injuries uh, that is so, worrisome uh, for sure yeah. <laughs> and so yeah and, and so and so I, in some sense I see that kind of technology as inevitable I don't really it's not surprising to me but it, it is um. It is interesting. It seems like the logical continuation to, you know, smartphones and, um, you know, like you, you said, the other, the, the digital bubble that we have and that we're sort of already engaged with. Yeah. I mean, the thing that is right, like you're saying, like we're already so wrapped into this and he, his goal here, and I, I heard it on the Rogan podcast, if, uh, and that was actually kind of what got me into uh, Joe Rogan. I am, um, <laughs> oddly enough um but if you get a chance it's a really interesting conversation because elon musk gets very stoned <laughs> and oh. his brain just kind of slows down a little bit you know which i think i can relate to right um uh as a as a cannabis user uh but the interesting thing is where they go with the conversation and he's talking about i mean he's really digging in there um and you can see the 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 gears kind of turning but the thing that blew my mind um, and it's something I kind of already thought, but didn't really know how to word it was that we're, we kind of lagged a little bit, like things are on a steady track to be, you know, kind of a crescendo where, you know, technology and understanding of psychology and, and physics and quantum physics and all this stuff is just coming to a head. Um, and I mean, if you look at the, the, you know, the, the, just the, the rate that things are moving memory and how fast that's expanded in size and how it continues to get faster and exponentially quicker. Um, I think we're getting to that point where it's just going to be kind of a crescendo and then it's going to be kind of over the, over the hill. Uh, but mm -hmm. I guess where I'm getting at with this is that, um, and we talked about this before, I'm sure some listeners are rolling your eyes a little bit, but uh, that there's going to be this lag like we're integrating with technology right now more than we ever have before it's almost that we're a cyborg but we had a little bit of a lag where we were using a mouse and a keyboard predominantly and then when we started to go to mobile phones it's smaller so it was either the small qwerty keyboard or touchscreen or you know whatever technology they can work around but you're still limited 
by the interface, which is your thumbs or your fingers. Um, and the thing that he's basically going for is that it will increase that bra what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, internet speed, basically not broad. You know, bandwidth. Bandwidth. Boom. Thank you. Yeah. The bandwidth in, in which um, data can be sent back and forth. And that's ultimately the goal is give us ability to automate and access our, our phones or our devices directly for a little while. And then I'm sure it'll just integrate to being a part of us. We'll have access information instantly. And But then the conversation, I think this is brought up in really well in the novel, because I mean, this is a case in government and society is how much control is there going to be of the access of that information? Because if all of a sudden, you know, we're connected in some sort of, I don't know, um, hive kind of consciousness, um, that there's going to be some sort of control over that. Right. And I think, I think that it's important to say that I think like uh, the stuff that we engage with through our, our phones, let's say, already exercises a degree of control over us that like, you know, isn't great. Like, for instance, like the filter bubble of, of ads targeting uh, specifically the things that you may search for or things like that. And that's kind of a subliminal negative influence, I would say, from the technology Definitely. we use. But, but there is like a kind of, I guess to use the word like exp experiential difference between engaging in something that, like you said, there's a sort of interface barrier between mm -hmm. yeah, and something that uh, you experience as, as a part of yourself. I think those are two, it's a subtle difference, but it's a difference that I think uh, would make a big difference. Uh, I think that if, if you had access to Google or, or and those ads targeted you from within your own consciousness, I think that that would be a very different experience to um, you know engaging with something on your phone that ultimately, if you did exercise in a, you know self control or whatever, you could put away or uh, you know reflect about and combat in some sense. But but if it's directly there in your mind, uh, <laughs> I don't see uh, where you can go from there. Do you think the mind would reject it, or are you saying that more of it's it's more of a like a, there's no way out of that kind of? Thing? Well, there's no way there's no way to kind of distinguish then between what's external and what's having an mm -hmm. uh, and uh, imposing an effect on you uh, right. versus. Do you, that, do you, you think know, that? Input. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, go ahead. Uh, do you think that like and this is kind of a, a thought process in the Matrix? I think was that um, like human beings couldn't accept this you know augmented fake reality because they it was too pleasurable too good right out of the gate um which made humans reject the thing because we're so used to suffering evolutionarily and and it just wouldn't it wouldn't register it wouldn't it wouldn't compute you couldn't accept uh, the illusion you'd, you'd right. see it as an illusion yeah exactly so actually there's there's a, a philosopher called um, robert nozick who he, he, he comes up with a thought experiment called the experience machine and oh. i mean the the just the gist of it is that if you um, were presented with, you know, with like, let's say the matrix or something, and they told you, um, you know, you can enter this machine and uh, your, you know, uh, ideal life, whatever uh, vision of paradise or whatever would come true and you could experience that. Um, but you would know that it's, uh, that it's an illusion, at least, I mean, I guess there's different versions of it. One version is, you know, that it's an illusion before going in, uh, but then you don't know once you're inside. And then the other version is, you know, even when you're inside. And I think the point he tries to make is that even if it comes with like, uh, you know, the warts <laughs> and, the, and the suffering and so on, that human beings care about uh, the authenticity of reality. That even if we, if, if we ex you know, it's, it's a fantastic, pleasurable uh, experience that we want it to be nonetheless real. That if it's an illusion, we, and, and probably some people would still take it even if it's an illusion. But for the most part, his, I think the point he's trying to make is that there's a tendency to to, to care about reality. Yeah. And, um, and we see that in the matrix. I think there's that one character, I forget his name, but the one who betrays them in the first movie, yes. um, he wants to go back in, but he, he doesn't want to know <laughs> anything about it. Yeah. He wants to have his memory wiped. Right. And, um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's true. Um, but I, I, I'm, I, I think it's true, but I've become more skeptical of it over time. I wonder, if, if people really do care anymore. And, and I think that that's the sort of, I think in, in my novel, at least that, that feeling has been eroded that people don't care anymore, that it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a feature of reality to ex consistently experience convincing illusions. And so it's kind of been absorbed into the concept of reality to the point that you don't have a problem with it anymore. 
right? They're so just like unfazed by it because they've experienced it so much. I mean, would that kind of, I mean, would that be kind of accurate? I, I just, I, that's kind of the impression I got that it was just, I, I, that there's lack, I think lack because, of empathy, yeah. you know? Yeah, it, I think it's because because it's so immediate in the way we were discussing earlier in the sense that uh, it's not, uh, it's a feature of their, of their minds really that they can sort of access uh, this kind of all-consuming video game-like world. And I, I think in one of the uh, kind of examples of the, of the, of the simulations that I, I give is like the person really like kind of forgets his own life because it lasts for so long, uh, or at least the feeling of it lasts for so long that he, he just sort of uh, gets accustomed to the, to the illusion as his, as his new life, if that makes sense. And, wow. um, and the, sense, the sense that I wanted to convey is that because of that immediacy that you can just sort of engage with this at any time, that that itself becomes, a, becomes part of reality to the, to the extent that you don't, you don't see it as a kind of artifice anymore. You don't see it as uh, a, an illusion that's, not, that's, that's somehow defective, um, if that makes sense. It does. Um, and I worry a lot about this, um, just experiencing it from a perspective as a father. Um, my son's nine, and mm -hmm. he's had electronics in, in his entire in his life, his entire life, which doesn't make me feel great as a parent to admit, but, uh, you know, uh, damned, be damned to cognitive dissonance, be damned. That's a, uh, I am, um, <laughs> I'm very much on the trying to think of these things and be you know conscious of them and not just you know i'm shitty at it still <laughs> but as much as I'm, I'm i'm accepting the reality that you know i'm not the greatest parent and the aspect that i let my kids sit in front of electronics more than i should um but he's also had it in front of him earlier than he should have in, in his life too so it's a really not to i love my son more than anything in the world but not to treat him like a scientific experiment but <laughs> sure from being a young child to now he's had an iPad since he was before he was a, a year old, which is really not um, something that doctors suggest is a good thing. Right. And, and mm -hmm. both my wife and I both knew it. Um, and we were both pretty bad at <laughs> preventing it because for parents, it's the easier idiot, idiot box. Like our generations had a lot, you know, TV and, and all that, but I didn't have a steady amount of internet in my life growing up until I was, you know, 19, I think, uh, uh, just cause, uh, you know, it's just kind of how it was. <laughs> um, right. and my parents did, you know, still had dial up and, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, where was I going? Um, my son is in front of electronics a lot more than I'd like to admit, but at the same time, there's been these really uncanny abilities to multitask, like, superhuman multitask stuff that I could not do uh you know like um where you can focus on one thing and be focusing on like three other things at the same time it's it's really bizarre uh but I think it's a product of that impulsivity and that generated stuff in front of their eyes all right the time. so I mean there was a point where I mean both my wife and I were like you know, shouldn't be introduced until he's like four screens in general uh and then you know the amount of time a day and all that stuff but I think that that's not necessarily realistic in this generation and the future generations. Uh, I think it's going to continue to go that way um, to an extent. But I think we have to step in front of that now, um, right. which is my goal. I'm trying to eliminate it, you know, out of his life for a while um, and really only have it be two hours a day max um, right. outside of school. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have children yet myself, but I, it's something that I worry about uh, for when I, I do, I mean, it's, something, it's something I do think about. Uh, so, I mean, good, best of luck with it. I, yeah. I can definitely, I mean, I struggle, I struggle with it myself. I try to keep myself away from, uh, you know, my phone more than I, than I do. And, and it's, it's, you know, another Same. failure, obviously. I, yeah. <laughs> Same. So, yeah. uh, I mean, that, that's, but that's, that's a really thing, a good thing to highlight. You know what I mean? Is that like, we can use technology in a, in a good, good way like we're doing right now i think it's very sure. uh, uh, productive and, and i think it, it generates a lot of ideas and people and concepts and, and and having the back and forth prevents us from living echo chamber uh but that type of technology i think in using that to better humanity isn't a bad thing right we can't be censored on the internet um the fcc in the united states can screw right off uh right. <laughs> which is great um that we can just kind of be who we are but Technology aside from that um, being designed to keep our attention all the time, um, 
you know, right down to daily active users on app platforms. They don't care about downloads. They care about how often it's being used, how often people are looking at it. Um, and they've designed things like just Facebook, social media, you know, uh, wish.com, uh, amazon.com. These just basic apps are designed to be stimulating in a way that it sucks you into it. Um, right which it does very effectively for all of us, I think. Um, and, you know, being cognizant of it is great, but man, stepping in front of that moving train is a motherfucker. Yeah. I mean, the, the, th the thing that I think about is that like, um, it's kind of eliminated our ability to be bored. And, you know, it, obviously in a, in a direct sense, that's like, a, you know, it seems like a good thing because who, who enjoys being bored, but, um, I mean that being bored is often what generates our like Creativity. best ideas, best re Absolutely. reflections. Like, I mean, that's why, you, you know, you have something that they call shower thoughts, but that in reality, you know, happen more frequently outside of the shower. It's just that <laughs> yes. the shower is the only place where you don't have. <laughs> or when you're driving home, if you're not, you yeah. know, heavy in the audiobooks. Um, right. I, uh, no, I agree. Uh, that's, yeah. uh, that, that was the fundamental discussion with my, my counselor and my, um, is that, you know, that um, constant stimulation is not any good because once you once it's gone, mm -hmm. it nothing is feels great. Nothing compares to that constant stimulation. And mm -hmm. for kids, that's all they know. So it's like we're feeding them this electronic drug at a young age. Um, and no wonder why they have issues with inattention, impulsivity, anxiety, depression. Um, I think that it's just uh, hyper, um, I guess, catalyzed a lot of those issues where, you know, um, in the United States, at least, I'm not sure if this is worldwide or if this is the United States, but uh, kids nine to 14 have suicides in that age have tripled in just wow. like three or four years. It's really bad. And it's, yeah. I mean, almost definitely attributed to electronics and not mm -hmm. just, but you sure. know, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, like the empathy um, piece of, of it, it's also important the older kids, they just start to lose that, um, that connection to it. And then their own lives and values of life becomes questionable. And the more we discuss Alton, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Simulation theory uh, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I think the more that's going to become problematic for people. Um, not that I, you know, want to silence ideas and concepts like that. Cause I think it's right. only a probability, but I just, yeah, I wonder the impact, you know? Well, I, I wonder about that. So simulation theory is like, um, I mean, there's different versions of it, but the one that I've heard frequently, which I kind of, it kind of irks me is the one that goes something like, uh, you know, we, it seems like our technology is advancing uh, in such a way or under such a trajectory that uh, we will be able to simulate reality in the future. And if that's true, then, uh, you know, then there, why shouldn't the future have already developed this kind of technology? And, and uh, wh why, why, wouldn't there, why wouldn't we be in the simulation now, right? That would be, that's right. something like the reasoning that I hear. Um, Base reality is a low probability it, kind of argument. Yeah, but, yeah. but it's, it's, a, it's a flawed argument because- I agree. Uh, like logically it, it's self-defeating because the point is that if if your conclusion is that okay then we're most likely living in a simulation now based on all these premises you can no longer make the assumptions that you originally made uh, to get to that conclusion in the first place because you can no longer make any knowledge claims about the world you can no longer say it seems like technology is advancing in such a way xyz because you've already said that reality isn't, isn't real and so it's predetermined how can you make any claims about that technology or, or it, which is apparently false? Right. Uh, so, and I do think that those are, it's dangerous. Like, you, you know, when someone's kind of pushes that argument as kind of an already settled debate when it really isn't. Yeah, it's definitely not. I yeah. mean, yeah. but not, I mean, I think I had this kind of argument recently with a friend of mine online and I try to avoid those because, you know, the whole break in words being inert and stuff. Um, I, people don't convey their sarcasm and, you know, meaning and all that stuff. But we were arguing about uh, settled science, right? Because obviously COVID's a real thing. Um, and his, the argument was asymptomatic spread isn't a real thing. 
And it's like, yeah, no, I mean, it's not nothing a hundred percent, not even gravity is a hundred percent settled science, right? I mean, it's a law, but it's argued that gravity could operate completely different. Space time and fabric could be all, you know, impacted completely different around a black hole. We really do not know outside mm -hmm. of our galaxy, outside of our, you know, you know, galaxy cluster. We can see mm -hmm. and guess and use mathematics, but there's always the, the probability of an anomaly. Um, and I think that that probability is just increased. So, you know, I don't know. Um, I guess the argument that I'm making is that, you know, we kind of don't have that to go on. We kind of need to rely on something. And science is the only solid base that we have. So when scientists spend their time, you know, putting time and effort into, you know, virology and all that stuff, we shouldn't discount it. Um, because right, definitely. it's, you know, we all of a sudden, you know, uh, saw something or read something that, you know, made us feel a little different. Unless you've really done the research, I don't feel like <laughs> you kind of have a place to stand there, you know, and yeah, yeah, not right. that I have, you know, but I, I've done a little bit more research than most. And I would say that I would leave that to the experts personally. Yeah, def and definitely. And I feel like when you're talking 90% of the medical community or even 98% when it comes to climate change, that's not settled, but it's pretty damn close to settled. Right. It's, it's more likely than not that it's, that it's true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think, I think Asimov said it best. He said something like, um, I don't remember ex the exact quote, but he, he sort of had a problem with the view that, uh, you know, my, my opinion is just as good as your knowledge or my, you know, yes. It's like, Yes. Those two things are, are, are not the same. That I I yeah. think I quoted that on Facebook once. <laughs> like I, I came across it and then reposted it. <laughs> yeah. But no, I, I uh and it's funny because I've I've read a, a decent amount of Asimov. The thing I I really like that find I find to be interesting is like the foundation series. And I haven't finished it because it's 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 uh, quite the endeavor. Um and it's not everybody's uh, got the patience for Asimov, but mm -hmm. I really uh, love that uh, that perspective um, there because I think it's too often people, especially with YouTube now, man, you just, anybody, any asshole like me can have a YouTube channel. And <laughs> it, it's like, we've got, you know, our thoughts and stuff, but I, I think it's too often that people don't really try or accept being wrong. Like I embrace it personally and this is maybe more recently in my life but it's not a bad thing to be wrong as long as you recognize that you're wrong and you do your best to learn and how to adapt around it mm -hmm. um but to just be like no <laughs> you know no <laughs> right yeah that's it <laughs> especially in our country right now it's fucking bananas uh how many people are just disconnected from reality entirely right now right not much difference than plunging yourself into a virtual reality, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, it seems like it. I mean, I, I also don't want to like come across as a, I mean, we sort of touched on this, but I don't want to come across as a, as a technophobe either. I mean, there, mm -hmm. even in the, in the novel, I think there's a, the, the people of Zothara and those like later chapters were sort of meant to be in some sense, the, the extreme opposite. Yes. Of, of uh, what we could be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, where you sort of throw away any technology or anything that uh, I was going to say that, that but like I'm glad you did because I didn't want to. Yeah. <laughs> I was care careful of the spoiler thing, but I'm oh, glad sure, that yeah. you said that because that that really that was a good point for me in the book because I, I I was hoping that there'd be some sort of um, I guess uh, dichotomy to the mm -hmm. um, the other. Uh, perspective uh, per se um, but it's really really a great um, I think uh, example of what things could be in a positive sense um, I, I just I, I really I'm, I try to be optimistic with our future I have a kid I, 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 I've always kind of been optimistic and I've had some reasons to not be but I, uh, I definitely think that if we are manifesting reality in any way, like there's more and more things to say that in some way, shape or form, our perspective is creating our realities around us, whether it's a simulation, I, I, I don't know, but I don't get that feeling 
from it. You know, I just have this like gut thing that uh, this is, this is based reality as improbable as it is. I feel like that <laughs> maybe it's just a really good simulation, <laughs> um, sure. but we, we do um, have this, you know, if things stay going the way it is right now um, and we don't destroy ourselves as a species first, mm -hmm. um, it's highly likely, you know, that we're get, going to get to the point where we're either creating AI and it wipes us out or we become one with the AI and that ultimately AI is inevitable. What, what are your thoughts on just AI outside of um, kind of where we've discussed so far? Um, you know, just um, entirely. Yeah. So, I mean, the thing, the thing to be like. with AI, and uh, yeah, it's not, it's not something um, for some reason that I think about as much as some of the other issues mm -hmm. uh, to do with technology and, and the future and so on. But I, I do think about it in terms of um, consciousness and uh, I mean, so, so like I have problems with things like the Turing test, which suggests that if a machine can fool you into thinking that it's intelligent uh, with, you know, by passing the Turing test, then right. that somehow it's considered uh, intelligent or conscious because in some sense, machines are already far more intelligent than us. I mean, a machine can calculate uh, you know, numbers and-, and, and Chess. Do, yeah, Full I mean, far, far better than, <laughs> than a human being ever, ever hey, could. And so, <laughs> and so here. it's, yeah, it's, and so it's not, it's not that that we're talking about when you talk about, um, whether a machine is, is quote unquote intelligent or conscious. And the sense that I get is that consciousness really has to do with um, the first personal experience. I mean, you could have, you could have a machine that, you know, let's say is, uh, has human, human feet, looks like a human being and acts like a human being in every way. Um, but is there anything going on inside? Is it, or is it just sort of like processors operating in the dark? And if that's the case, then we are still talking about a machine, and I don't, I don't really have any new or, 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 or kind of, I would say, revolutionary thoughts about what those the consequences of that could be. You know, it yeah. could be like the, the Matrix, or it could be a disaster, or it could be, uh, you know, as you say, we somehow integrate it as part of us. I don't know, but yeah. the um, the thing that I would say is that if, on the other hand, it, it turns out, I don't know how you'd be able to verify this, but if it turned out that those machines were conscious, that there was something there was a kind of a first personal experience or awareness that they had, like just like we experience it or similar, uh, that it wouldn't really be an, an AI anymore. I mean, it would be artificial to the extent that it was kind of created by human beings, but I would call that a person uh, at yeah. that point. I know right. that's controversial, but that's sort of my position. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I, they, I think like in the matrix, they kind of discuss this kind of well uh, in the aspect of like, is love you know, what is love? What is it? A, is it a feeling? Is it a word? Does there's the connection that the word implies, I think was the, um, the discussion and, and, and that like a program could a program feel love. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it, it's, it's a really, it's a really tough thing to dive into because what are we as you know, a species other than a collection of chemical and electrical impulses. Um, so, I mean, couldn't technology just be a, a better, um, better set of hardware, I guess, um, like um, for that type of consciousness? Like, I, I don't know. I mean, there's so many things there to, that, that really become tough with AI. Um, for me, at least, uh, the thought is if we, I mean, it's really kind of that, are, are we going to have a convergence of technologies that's going to create an AI, AI with us? Like the convergence of biotechnology, nanotechnology, software technology, AI software technology, rather, um, all kind of combining together, like um, in Pray by Michael Crichton, um, where the, you, it's creating almost identically a human being, um, but it's not obviously a human being, a human 2.0, so to speak. Mm. Um, I mean, is that not the direction we should be trying to go for the benefits of space travel, uh, for the benefits of being able to live for longer periods of life? 
and then choose to delete itself. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like there's uh, so many ways it could go. Uh, definitely hurts my brain when I start to really yeah. get into it. <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> I, uh, I don't really have a, an answer except to say that I'm uh, maybe by default kind of always skeptical of, of how those new developments could be abused or how they could uh, present an unforeseen or, uh, yeah. or easily ignored threat. Uh, but it's, uh, that doesn't mean obviously that there can't be uh, good outcomes. And uh, right. I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, no, no, no. I, I feel I feel the same way. It's, it's kind of one of those things that nobody can really know, but we can toss around the idea. Uh, but I think that the um, our uh, our ability to kind of catch up with technology, at least in this country, is a concern, um, big time, uh, because we're not we're not thinking of it in terms of technology. We're thinking of it in terms of just an old school way of thinking, like the dichotomy of capitalism versus socialism uh, is almost being irrelevant now you know people like Ayn Rand and Karl Marx could have no idea or concept of uh, you know AI technology and to them it was flights of fancy you know where well at least Ayn Rand uh, I think that you know where people start to lose track uh, of what's important is when we start to dive too much into the superficialities of um of uh of those things uh without looking at the fact that we're changing at such a rapid rate that if we just stay doing this the next 20 years are going to look way different i think mm -hmm. um and you know people are like, why don't we have flying cars yet it's like i don't think that's how it works i feel like it, it's all <laughs> been building up and now we're going to see it manifesting quicker in front of ourselves um but it, that that's not how it worked for the last 70 years um but or even before that, if you look at it, it's very telescoping, uh, hominid of man uh, down to um, the different breaks in, in time periods, the Renaissance, uh, technological um, revolution and, and all of those things just getting closer and closer together um, in a way that, you know, we're seeing like when I worked at Radio Shack in 2008, 16 gigabytes cost $128 uh, mm -hmm. for, of, of a tiny memory card um, that's just blown out of the water now. And it's happened very quickly. It's going to continue to even increase, I think. So um, I, I wonder if we're going to get to that point uh, where we, everything's, you know, either changes or we, uh, we, we, we can't keep up. Um, I'm even worried about on the, to come back down from the you know being way up in the existential <laughs> discussion <laughs> uh but back down to reality a little bit just day-to-day -day stuff uh how that's going to impact jobs and all that stuff for people because right. it is rapidly replacing that right people aren't looking at it that way they're saying well it's always kind of been that way but technology doesn't work like that like how it was before and i'm not a luddite either like i i don't i'm not um, looking at technology as a negative. I just think we have to be realistic about it and understand it and put our time and effort into that and then harness it to the right. good of human beings, not to our detriment or for, you know, um, I guess uh, solely for profit, obviously. The, there's going to be always benefits um, there, but... Yeah, I'm just kind of rambling at this point. <laughs> it's all good. I mean, it's it's those are serious concerns, you know. Yeah. I uh, I mean, so the the concept that if we are in a similar sim simulation, I think the Matrix made a kind of a good point. Um, just kind of a random thought popping in my head is that um, the things like deja vu, aliens. You know, all that stuff being anomalies in a complex system. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting perspective. That's not what I think. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, especially with recent events, it's gotten real weird. Yeah. Um, <laughs> real weird. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I'd love to hear your perspective on that. I'm sure most of our listeners are laughing or rolling their eyes again because of the alien discussions coming up. But it's been just in the last week and four days like if if you're you know you just type it into google there's some reputable uh 
uh, oh, the, uh, the, you're talking about the, uh, Israeli, um, uh, I don't remember his position in government, that, but is the official who said this the space the defense guy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's one of them. Uh, but, uh, definitely one of them. Uh, and, and not that I'm super like, it sounds, it's hard for me, uh, previously being very skeptical about a lot of things, um, being pretty hard skeptic and, and recently, man, I, I, it's, it's been hard for me to stay as skeptical. Um, when you have like the David Fravor thing with the, uh, you know, the air force pilot there. Um, and then just recently, um, pictures from the inside of a cockpit of a, of a plane. Then there was the, the one, um, on the airliner jet where you see it kind of coming out of the clouds that, that was, it's jarring for sure because um mm -hmm. the pentagon is is recognize these things as as real um mm -hmm. and they don't know what they are obviously but it's a concern to them because they've 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 the um uh, i can't think uh, disarmed uh, nuclear weapons um mm -hmm. and have jammed radar and things like that we don't really know what's or they say they don't know uh, what they are exactly but they're definitely there and uh, they're capable of physics that we're not as human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, for uh, for a while, I mean, my thought, just trying to rationalize it, is that you know, um, the simulation thing, or people from the future, uh, us from the future, and the reason why they can't, you know, integrate with us is uh, because of paradox. I don't know, <laughs> just. I'm not aware of the um, of, like the specific um, like instances that you're talking about, but if the uh, like the question is like about um, whether there are aliens or uh, is that is that sort of what you? I mean, yeah. What's your what's your thought on uh, just the that? I mean, I should have brought this up earlier when we were talking in the email. Is something uh, okay, to sure. <laughs> send you a couple of links, and I'll, I'll definitely send you a few links because this sure. is it's it's really interesting. But if you go a little while back, David Fravor did an interview with Joe Rogan, and then uh, there was a couple of um, you know declassifications, and mm -hmm. uh, the Pentagon guy left, and uh, Luis Elizondo, I think his name was, uh, he was former. Uh, head of the ufo task force for the pentagon or whatever left and joined the <laughs> basis of blink 182 and the okay. to the stars <laughs> academy which is really <laughs> weird um but yeah. then they i mean they started producing a lot of you know valid um valid evidence that wasn't being refuted by the united states government oddly enough okay, okay. um and then they then they released the, the pentagon released the mm -hmm. the um these uh, radar uh, images and views and all that stuff. Anyway, that I think my question is, is um, what do you think that it's likely that we're being visited uh, by, you know, creatures from another or beings from another dimension, um, uh, planet? I have no idea, but um, what, what, you know, what do you think is more likely? Um, well, it's hard to say because so when I think about aliens, I think of like different categories of aliens. So if uh, if we're just talking about, let's say, like bacteria or like low level organisms, sure. I think it's pretty certain that those exist. exist. I'd, be, I'd be like very shocked and surprised if they didn't like. Uh, I they, think it's, it's almost impossible mathematically. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, like statistically, just the number of planets there are in the universe and um, uh, and the fact that we, I mean, we know now that there are Earth-like um, planets that orbit like similar suns and have like similar temperatures and atmospheres. Um, so I, I'd find that very, I think even like, I mean, even in our own solar system, uh, I think there's good evidence that there are you know, low level organisms in, under the ice in, in Europa, yeah. uh, one of the moons of Jupiter. But uh, so that seems like, uh, you know, but then again, that's, not also, that's also not very interesting. So the question is like, yeah. is there like, you know, are there like more are there octopus like, aliens yeah, living in yeah. there, you know? that's what i yeah, want to like know. yeah like intelligent conscious whatever you want, you want to call it uh i don't know it's it seems also statistically probable that those exist uh i think i but i, I always think about the fermi paradox which is like yeah again statistically it seems like they should exist but if they do exist they also like you know statistically or pro according to probability would be older than us and therefore 
more likely to be more advanced than us. Right. Uh, like and the so Christmas that, tree light uh, thing with the Fermi paradox is that like the lights on and then the other one's off and then the other light comes on and they're just <laughs> never at the same time. Yeah. Um, and so, and so it's, it, and so that the question is uh, if that's all true, why though have we not been, uh, you know, visited or, or, or why is there no like, uh, you know, se seeming evidence or alleged evidence or whatever uh, about, you know, those visitations? Uh, or contact. Uh, and so the question the answer, I guess, is I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. I, I haven't yeah. seen person, I haven't myself seen anything to suggest that, uh, that those things exist, but I also don't really research uh, yeah. very no, closely. I, that I've stuff. always kind of debunked it as uh, until I have proof, like I've seen some stuff that I can't explain to be completely honest with you living in New Hampshire. Um, but it doesn't, it's not you know, for me, it's always been, well, that doesn't mean it's an, a UFO. It doesn't mean that it's uh, aliens. It means that I didn't recognize, maybe it's unidentified to me, but mm -hmm. who the fuck am I? Like, I could see right. a plane and be like, oh, that might be a UFO. <laughs> like, I have no idea, right? Like, sure. uh, but I have seen a couple of things that were like, all right, that's not probably a plane, uh, but that's really weird. And, you know, I live near an Air Force base in New Hampshire and <clears throat> it could be a, a big plane coming in but you know I, I had a couple of experiences that i i would say i probably won't go into too much but made me really uh re-question um what i thought at least i believed i could see i, did, I didn't I, I don't know i it doesn't it was hard because you see something like that and for me i'm just unreasonably skeptic so i could see something and still i mean like yeah but What's the angle here? Who, who's who's got the rubber suit? <laughs> you know what I mean. Right. Like I'm still yeah. gonna be super skeptical that it's not just uh, some illusion. Product of Occam's razor, I guess. I don't know how to explain it, but uh, yeah, that it's it's more likely just gonna be the simplest explanation. I mean, yeah. I, I again, it's just something I I don't know enough about, but just based on the little I do know, I I, I wouldn't be surprised, but I. The, the Fermi the paradox <laughs> yeah. thing. Well, the Fermi paradox is a perfect example and Drake equation. Like what's the likelihood that one, they would be uh, in this, be um, a civilization at the same time of us Two that we could communicate to them uh, mm -hmm. via radio waves. Like that's such a, I, I'm assuming archaic way for a higher civilization to uh, send information. Like it doesn't, it, you, you're limited like, yeah. by space time and, Light. I guess the, the yeah I guess the view like I don't know if this is uh, how true this is but I guess the view would be that like reality um, or maybe reality is not the right word like the physical world is structured in such a way that for a mind to interact with it a mind of any kind there have to be some kind of universal similarities I don't know if this is true this is just like one theory um, uh, and therefore that any kinds of intelligent uh, conscious uh, alien species would have some kind of shared capabilities uh, that we do, if not all of them. Um, and so I guess that's that's kind of one of the assumptions behind the Fermi paradox is that like, if there are aliens and they would be able to discover radio waves and, and, and use them uh, in the same way that we do, or if, if not slightly different. Uh, it seems like that's one of the assumptions behind that argument. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. Um, and I mean, my my concern is like in that that the Fermi paradox really kind of ends the possibility that we could easily communicate um, and get messages that are going to be relevant to when they send them because we're experiencing time on a different you know dilation sure. or whatever. Um, but if if it were you know if they were to send information. Uh, I think that, yeah, I mean, that becomes really problematic when two, you have two civilizations or multiple civilizations, they all have to exist at the same time. How are they going to communicate? And does one have the ability to physically leave the planet before it destroys itself? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, what's have the likelihood you, of that? Have you read um, uh, Solaris by uh, Stanislaw Lem? Is that... Um, Yes, that's the, I, I, it, a long time ago. It's like a 1970s book, right? Yeah, it came out a, while, yeah. a, while, a long time ago. It's, uh, I think that that's, that's uh, actually that influenced uh, me a lot um, on the sci-fi side of things. Uh, I think that's a really good exploration of that 
that problem of like if there were aliens out there uh would they be different in such a way that it would be like almost impossible to really communicate uh, uh i mean because in that book i mean the whole planet is the alien and it's, right. and it's right, so foreign right. it doesn't it, it's it, i mean there are there are you know some basic ways that where, where there's like movement and maybe sounds emitted and so on but that's uh, you know really it and uh, right. uh yeah i mean that's that's a I think that's. I mean, we we could be on a part of a living being, right? This Mm -hmm. planet could be a conscious living thing, and we would have no idea and any understanding of their time spans, uh, life. I mean, because time is so abstract based on your ability to measure it, which is relative to your own experience. Like, I, it, it's crazy to think that you know, especially like in Solaris, where you have a a planet kind of manifesting things in reality, and I just it's highly probable that we'd be unable to meet, communicate or just are we going to put the time and effort in it? We don't even try to communicate with the creatures in our ocean, yeah. Uh, yeah. which is like mind boggling because yeah. they're obviously intelligent. And mm-hmm. the, especially um, octo- octopi and, you know, I don't know the proper name for the species, but um, squids and, and whatnot, they're, they're hi- pretty highly atel- intelligent. Um, and mm-hmm. well, especially specifically octopus, um, at least uh, as far as I know, um, are really just absolutely amazing creatures. Mm-hmm. And they are very alien compared to us biologically. That's true. Um, yeah. and, and we just like, we have some people that are, but a lot of people are just like, you know, we're looking up, we have barely explored our own oceans. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. To the point where the speculation now is that there are, um, you know, the UFOs are in the oceans, leaving the ocean. It's really, it's pretty wild. Some of the stuff. Oh, that's um, interesting. I haven't it, heard that. <laughs> well, so that was, um, cool. this, if you get a chance, there's an interview with Joe Rogan and David Fravor. And um, I forget the third guy's name, but he, he um, he's trying to, you know, I guess debunk a lot of the, um, not debunk, but um, eliminate any type of skepticism or surrounding UFOs. Um, so there's definitely an angle there from the guy who's bringing these guests on, but this, this pilot, David Fravor, um, was saying that there's multiple accounts of these um, from Air Force pilots. The government recognizes it. They're coming out of the water a lot of times and just going straight up. They operate with physics. They're completely different than ours where they can shift in and out of phase space um, quickly and uh, where they can instantaneously just pop in and out of, reality basically uh so that you know they're traveling through water but it's not necessarily even um uh, they're you know that there's it's they're not propelled by the same dynamics or anything they could just move in and out of different mediums and it, it doesn't change the speed of the craft or anything um which is it's kind of interesting kind of coming from the government because the I think the conversation really for me lately has been, well, what's the angle, you know, why, <laughs> what is the reason they're providing us all this information now? Mm-hmm. Like there's, they're never just going to give info freely. So right. what are they trying to worry us about? You know? <sighs> so, well, that's, that sounds interesting. I uh, have to, I'll have to, to watch that. It's, it's definitely made me relook at a few things because I've seen a couple of like, documentaries that I kind of consider to be kind of crackpot documentaries, Mm -hmm. I guess I would say I shouldn't, you know, say that's kind of discounts, you know, Stephen Greer, but his stuff right out of the gate, I was like, nah, I don't know (laughs) about all this. But (laughs) now with the recent light of events where the the Pentagon starts releasing these things in the time span that he said it was going to happen, Mm-hmm. man and some of the stuff that they're saying like the israeli guy and all that is it lines up exactly with what this guy's saying mm-hmm. and there's a lot of stuff that does make a lot of sense fear campaigning mm-hmm. propaganda to, for 60 years to make us afraid of aliens so we can have reason to go and try to take their technology the same way we do with foreign oil because uh, we just want 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 you know America, fuck yeah! Like, and it's specifically the American government doing this, right? And of course, of course. Oh God, man! Sometimes this country, I love a lot of things about it, but it, there's some things that are just mind blowing. And of course, we've got you know a super, super mentally stable person running all of it. Right. 
<laughs> for a couple more days. Jesus, yeah. we can just get to the 20th. For the love of God. <laughs> like, not that I'm super gung ho about Joe Biden, right? But sweet yeah. Jesus, things are bananas here. It's the worst it's ever been. And, uh, you know, I mean, luckily I live in New Hampshire, but in some ways it's, it's been, uh, it's been more certain. The last four years have been more bizarre than, you know, aliens, you know, being, being real. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. To the, to the point where during the pandemic, they had these major Pentagon releases this and verifies this and acknowledges the existence of UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomena, um, and that there's a task force and that Congress is going to have a congressional hearing. Marco Rubio's running the task force for Cong Congress, like all kinds of wild stuff that's going on. And nobody is talking about it. Like there was something, everybody's just asleep at the wheel. People are like, <laughs> yeah, but what about, uh, you know, what about uh, that that new uh, WAP song? Like, like just <laughs> people are just so just wrapped up in all the stuff that the president's doing and all that. They're all focused on that. And there's some major stuff that's happened and people are just like, yeah, but we're not even really, we didn't even know. Uh, so many people I talk about have no idea even about some right. of these things, which is, uh, is not the fault of theirs, but definitely the media bias is trying to swing things a certain way and have you mm -hmm. focus on certain things and then they're slowly leaking this stuff to kind of warm people up to it and then eventually there's going to be a bombshell about aliens like i, I don't like really <laughs> uh sorry I, it is something that uh is is definitely a concern uh meanwhile you know going through this like crazy human event um socially and like this has been a, a very interesting um time for all this stuff to happen it's almost like everything over the last five years have been like you know all building up and, and speeding up to this time frame where it's where mm -hmm. we're seeing stuff happen really quickly um right in front it, of it us. does feel like that uh the moment on the roller coaster when you can you go down <laughs> to yeah. the incline yeah yeah. And that's, 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 um, I mean, almost like, a to the point of like, like, a like, like a couple thousand years of like building up to this like crazy, crazy crescendo and everybody's waiting for this weird augmented reality climax. Like, I don't want it to be like that, but I'm, I'm wondering like, holy shit, what's going to happen next. And whether it's like aliens, whether it's, hey, we live in a simulation. Hey, it's, you know, Donald Trump launched a friggin' weapon at a, some guy in a, you know, car in Iran. And, you know, it was a big deal politically. And now they're pissed. Like, what is it going to be next? What am I going to wake up mm -hmm. to tomorrow morning? You know, and then there was like George Floyd and the whole world erupts in, in anger, understandably. Like, mm -hmm. what? It's just so crazy as all of these different things kind of lay out. Um right. And everybody's just staring at their phone, <laughs> kind of yeah. complacent, and and then the people who aren't are just really pissed off, right? Whew. That that, that kind of divisiveness outside of just like the political divisiveness and all the other craziness that's going on is uh, it's bizarre to say the least. It it is bizarre. It's uh, I mean that's that's uh. It's like sh shocking that things so quickly have degenerated. I I don't even know what to say about it. Right, right. I mean, it's it is a, it's a tough topic because I want to see the positive ways out, and I do in some aspects. Like I, I can always find a little bit of a an angle when things look really kind of awful. <laughs> um, like the discussions about where we are with you know some aspects of technology and stuff that we're we're using not necessarily beneficial to ourselves um but then you have things like podcasts um and then so you know you have negative things like donald trump but there are some positive aspects as much as i hate to admit it and i don't really I'm not a big fan of the guy um actually it's I hate him, <laughs> but it, it really has just uncovered a lot of just mm -hmm. filth and corruption and, and all kinds of stuff and just made it very, very relevant. Um, 
and people are talking about it and it's 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 contentious but it is important that people are seeing this as reality and know that there are two things that are going on. Not that I paint the media as a bad thing, but there's certainly mm-hmm. their own spin and they have it. Yeah, own, for sure. Um, you know, I, I worry though about, about that. I don't know that it's a good thing. I, I mean, certainly from like the perspective of like wanting to know the truth and so on, but it seems to me that uh, at least in politics, like sometimes illusions are positive. <laughs> like it, it, it might, it might actually be yeah. better that, you know, everyone believed that things are not as bad or corrupt as they really are, uh, because knowing or believing in that, in, in fact, you know, generates a worse outcome for everyone. Right. Uh, even if even if it's not the truth, I, uh, it's a sure. tough situation. Because at the same time, I'm sort of like dedicated to, uh, you know, the truth and and so on. But uh, yeah, at, uh, but I I can't help but think that politically, it seems often better for certain illusions to remain in place. No, I agree. I mean, there is yeah. a, a amount of uh, just, uh, I think, like a, a kind of an, <laughs> uh, an opiate for the masses uh, that is almost kind of necessary because of an unwillingness to self-educate or self-motivate. I'm not sure what it is with human beings right now, uh, yeah. but there's this, this rut kind of. Um, and I do, I do think that um where we are you know questioning the media and all of those things aren't necessarily a a, a terrible thing um but where we are painting our own realities because of it i guess i'm i'm not i'm I'm having a hard time kind of uh, explaining what i mean but um almost that see how do i put it that's a major pause here but um how we're talking to each other is kind of the way out of it right Mm -hmm. like um in the positive way through it uh, and how we're going to kind of be okay with the opiate for the masses like that 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 complacent comfortable positivity like i don't know that that necessarily exists but uh i think the the one thing that we do have as a way out of it that's a benefit a positive um with kind of being the truth being really on display and almost in a jarring uh, confrontational manner uh, is that it gives us the opportunity, at least in the United States to vote people out entirely. Right. Um, yeah. So, so that, that's the, that's the sort of glass half full, I suppose, way of looking at it. And, yes. I, and I agree. I, I do agree with that, but I also worry that, um, you know, if people stop having faith systematically in institutions and uh, you know positions of leadership and so on, and and everything sort of becomes a mockery, a joke, a uh, like a uh, you know c- like a cynical sort of uh, farce. Yeah. Uh, then then it's very easy for those institutions and those uh, you know positions, uh, which which are not entirely dysfunctional most of the time. Like they, <laughs> it's it's uh, you know like they say, perfect is the uh, enemy of good enough. Uh, yeah. It's very, it becomes very easy for those things to, to really lose their effectiveness more than they they otherwise you know would. Um, that's that's what I worry about. But I also I also agree that you know um, it allows for for change uh, for things to be improved upon. Yeah. No. I mean, I think the uh, the efficacy of those things are super important, um, and because. I like I don't doubt that this most recent election uh, was accurate in the United States. I think that they've done a really good job in making sure that it was as accurate as they could be. Um, mm-hmm. But the in in I mean, if you look at the numbers, there was a heavy swing towards the third party uh, compared to the last election to different third parties because a lot of people didn't want to vote for either of the candidates. But at the same time, a lot of people wanted to vote. Trump out 
So mm -hmm. Trump, I think, lost to a lot of the third party, but so did Biden some too. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the the thing there that was really representative of it being a product of reality <laughs> is that you could see how close and how many people voted in this election to vote the other person out, mm -hmm. right? P there was a lot of people that were heavily charged by what was going on. Um, and I think that there was also, you know, there's a lot of advantages drawn on both sides, but the, um, the understanding that our political system isn't rigged and that, <laughs> that, Right. <laughs> you know, it's not corrupt. Um, it's, it's kind of important. Yeah, exactly. Today, there's an election in Georgia, super important. And the Republicans have literally painted themselves. They walled themselves in, you know, they, they shot themselves in the foot because they're saying this election is rigged, but come out and vote for us. Right. At this rigged election. Yeah, <laughs> like what the actual shit are you guys trying to do? And right. I think that that isn't a bad thing. Uh, certainly for us, if the Democrats take control, not that I'm again a Democrat, I, I do think that there's a benefit, at least you know, how our political system works swinging back and forth with the two party pendulum there. Um, and it's just been way too much shit that's happened in four years. Mm -hmm. And it's got to rebalance out the other way because it's it's been rough and also we need money because a lot of us are dying in the streets right. <laughs> like it's so bad uh, yeah. people are losing their houses and everything and by no fault of their own tough time for uh for the economy and people in general um but i think that there's you know there's a way out of this we've we've found a lot of positivity and and you know trying to work together there's this cool youtube if you're into music and creation and stuff that's created by a uh, actor joseph gordon levitt uh, he's a guy from third rock from the sun for listeners out there who are not familiar um but he uh he's got a youtube channel called hit record i think it is and i've, I've heard of it yeah that's that's great that that whole uh uh, the whole thing was really great. Um, and for people out there not familiar with it, it's uh, basically just a, a bunch of people working together to create you know, music and videos and, and stuff, uh, which it's just a community-based uh, type thing, which I, I just thought was really cool during the pandemic. A lot of people working over Zoom. And mm -hmm. I think those are the, the, the things that if we can focus on, then maybe we yeah. can positively manipulate our reality a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. It's worked for me in some aspects. If I can really be positive or just unrelenting on what I'm going to do, um, I've got to the point where, you know, I've uh, been able to do things that I'm happy about in my life. But I was unrelenting on this is going to happen. This is where I'm going to get. And, and, you know, this is just going to be how it is. I didn't see it as any other possibility. And I think that some people who, do that um, tend to be the ones that write novels uh, that uh, are, you know, making space travel a reality uh, mm -hmm. for private companies, like, uh, or in just pushing uh, us out into into the into the planets. Uh, people, um, you know, just artists creating really emotionally impactful work, like all of those things are so important um that that type of passion and and, and drive in people um mm -hmm. to um put themselves into their passion um right that's the that's what i see um i hope glass uh, glass half full like you're saying yeah <laughs> for sure um but i i hope that that's that's where we're where we're gonna go um because I, I like the other alternative. It's very, very bleak. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who does, right? I, I think things will improve. I, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm being overly po posit uh, <laughs> positive about it, but it seems like things are slowly getting better uh, over last year. I might be wrong. But... Yeah, I, uh, I, I kind of feel the same way. I mean, 
I think that things are kind of inching in that direction. Um, and I, I hope, I mean, 2020 was just brutal. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's a really awesome like documentary that just popped up on Netflix. I'm not sure if you've seen it or not. Um, but, uh, or this, or this is 2020 or uh, something about uh, like basically a documentary in 2020, a fictional documentary. Okay. Uh, it's hilarious. <laughs> Absolutely hilarious. Samuel Jackson and all kinds of stuff. I, I'll have to, I'll have to see it. I, I'm, I haven't heard of it. It's, it's worth watching. I, I just came across it like literally the other night just popped up. Okay. I'm like, what is this? Like that, it literally just ended. How did they make a documentary? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but it was very obviously satire, but hilarious. Um, I, I haven't laughed that hard in a while. So, and I, I'm, I've got a pretty, uh, dry sense of humor and there's a lot of stuff i find hilarious that i don't laugh at but i mm -hmm. genuinely gut laughter you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. Great. <laughs> i'll um, have to look at it um, look it the uh you know the the other thing i would say would be that like the technology transformation in some positive ways um you know i mean i guess you could look at two sides negative like you've, we've got a lot more access to um arts and streaming content and things like that because uh, i do consider mo movies to be art well some movies to be art <laughs> um, uh, some movies are garbage but i um I, I i like the aspect that more and more people have access to create that art freely um, yeah less stranglehold by um, major corporations and 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 all that like netflix provides so much funding to some really unwatchable stuff to be completely honest uh <laughs> yeah. i and then some stuff that's really great and right. uh no I, I mean i completely agree with you i think if it weren't for um you know the uh i don't know the state of technology at the moment like i i highly doubt my book would have like ever reached uh uh, you know, it, it's the readers that I, the, the few readers that I, that I do have because, uh, because it's not, it just doesn't conform to that, uh, Agreed. You know, to the, mo to the model, uh, required for, uh, uh, the alternative, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'll be honest. I, uh, what got me was the name. Okay. I, cool. I, 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 uh, I, I saw the name and I'm like, what is this and then it was like sci-fi and i dug in <laughs> and then i'm like wow this is pretty pretty long um <laughs> i'm definitely on board because i i like i like long reads you know um sure um specifically because you know well i was driving a lot and the audiobooks were kind of a benefit but i also like immersion reading where I kind of read along with um narrators and whatnot mm -hmm. um because for me really absorbing all of it is super important. Mm -hmm. And I know myself, I'm a pretty fast reader. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm reading novels unaided, I guess. Uh, it, benefit of ADHD is I can read quickly and catch a lot of information and in, in, in mm -hmm. absorb it. Uh, the downside is, is I can get distracted easily and I miss context sometimes mm -hmm. or subtleties, nuance that is super important in a book. And I think actually, you know, Stephen King made a really good argument for this in audiobooks is that they, um, they, provide, a, they provide a bridge over that. And no matter how good you are as a reader, uh, mm -hmm. no matter how grammatically, uh, you know, uh, acquainted you are, uh, it, it really, the audiobook is always going to provide you more context uh, for the most part, uh, for most mm -hmm. readers, uh, because they, most readers ravage books. They mm -hmm. pass through it. And Stephen King was saying the same thing. And I was like, I, I actually, I identify with that. Um, right. A lot. That's interesting. I, I, uh, I have kind of a different perspective on that. I, I mean, I love audiobooks and I, yeah. I listen to them frequently, uh, but I cannot listen to complicated books or books that, uh, where I feel like the writing is so good that I need to pay attention to the writing itself. Yes. Uh, yeah. By audio, I cannot listen to those by audio because a, I feel like I am losing something. B, I uh, I actually get confused and, and lose uh, lose where like what's going on. Yeah. Uh, 
And maybe that's because I'm actually quite a slow reader. And so I benefit from actually uh, reading those complicated books at a slower pace, which isn't my normal pace. But, uh, but so for me, I reserve audiobooks for books where, and it's not to say anything about the, the quality of the book, but, uh, but for books that are more like linear or have simpler writing styles. Sure. Um, yeah. I kind of agree with that. I, uh, I, there, so there's a lot of aspects like I like fiction and, um, and, and narrators because of voice acting and stuff, but the, like Michael Crichton, for example, um, I'm not sure if you've, uh, you're familiar with, uh, any, any of his novels, but I, I haven't read any, any of his novels, but I, I mean, I've heard of him, of course. It's very interesting how he blends, um, fiction with scientific data and mm -hmm. you know actual science in his novels uh it's not always represented as well i guess in movie adaptations which there have been a lot um i really liked how well he made it um integrated into the into the novel and i would say you did the, the same thing with the philosophy in the aspect of sci-fi uh where it's oh, kind of similar on uh, the technical aspects um for him and how he interweaves science and um heavy to the point where sometimes people don't want to read it timeline right. there's this discussion about thatched roof and it's like a half a chapter about how the ro roof was okay made ne like neil stevenson is ooh. a bit like that i don't know if you've uh, if you've read anything of his but uh, i haven't actually I recommend, I mean, I've only read two of his books and I'm reading a third one now, but uh, one that I, the one I quite liked was uh, Cryptonomicon. Yeah, um, I have that downloaded on Audible and okay. started it, but I got distracted by some things that came out and I never got back to it. So, oh no, yes, it's a, it's quite a good, it's quite a good read. And he, he does go into, um, I wouldn't say like a unbearable level of like de technical detail, but like enough to, that you can sort of see that he, he he's like, you know, somewhat of a semi-expert on like code breaking and mm -hmm. and and that kind of um uh like the stuff that went on in world war ii uh with the submarines and the uh i mean even even the, even some of the more modern day uh aspects of of cryptography uh and it's and it's really it's really enjoyable it's not like reading a textbook or anything like that so i i really recommend that i'm going to definitely um uh dig into that because I, now, I you know i'm trying to look at what it is that i have so i have that and then An anathem uh, oh, that's the one I'm, I'm reading right now actually i uh i'm not far enough yet to say like what i you know think of it but i'm i'm quite enjoying it actually uh it's definitely more uh philosophically oriented than uh, uh than the other two that i read of his okay um, did you read yeah. seven eves no, I haven't, but I've heard that that one is also like very hard sci-fi. Yeah. I did read that. Now I was like, wait, that I did read. I'm like, it, it, isn't that the book that? I, yeah, that was awesome. That was phenomenal. I really okay. liked it a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. That whole concept um, was really, really great. Uh, with you know, um, the, the I, I don't want to give a lot of stuff away, but you know, the transition from earlier part of the novel uh, where humanity is just kind of hanging on. Um, and then a later part, latter part of the novel, which takes place in the future where uh, humanity is kind of uh, shifted into multiple races of humans. So to speak, or multiple species variants. I, I don't know exactly how to explain it, but um, awesome. For me, at least, I really enjoyed the book. Um, highly recommend. Yeah, he's, he, he's, uh, he's, I mean, so far, I mean, the, the two books I read of his and two and a half, really, the, the first one I didn't. I didn't like as much as people seem to like for some reason. I didn't dislike it, but uh, which is Snow Crash. Yeah, I was going to uh, say it's a Snow Crash because I was. Yeah, it, it didn't. It didn't appeal to me as much as the. But I, I really truly loved uh, Cryptonomicon. I thought that was like a, a fantastic book, and I'm I'm quite enjoying Anathem so far. So. That's yeah. awesome. So yeah. I am that now. I'm I've got them uh, first on my list as soon as I'm uh, done with uh, blasting through. Carrie, which I've never read before, actually. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> which is like uh, a quick, fairly quick read uh, so far. But I, I'm everybody's like, what? Like I, I've read a lot of, you know, Stephen King, um, and okay. I, I like his work because I like, I like the ability to, I like heavy character mm -hmm. studies um, uh, quite a bit actually. Um, but I guess I, I do like heavy background building 
You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Uh, and I think that's something you do very well in this novel. Uh, that And that's what drew me in the most right out of the gate. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you, uh, you liked it. <laughs> I, I think I do, I do at least, um, especially when I was writing uh, The Measurements of Decay, I was uh, very focused on, uh, I don't know, I, I think some people have called it like pictorial writing, like trying to really give an image, like imagistic writing. Um, that... Um... That's and exactly try, what drew me in right out of the gate. Okay, yeah, and I, tr- I tried to do that, I think, because much of the novel is quite abstract to the, to the I mean, in, in the sense that there is no, like, picture, really, like, uh, to go along with whatever, you know. Um, but so the parts of the book, which are mostly the third personal uh, narration parts, I did try to make uh, quite imagistic, and I'm, gl- I'm glad it, it seems to have come through uh, in some sense. Oh, I think you're, you've muted yourself. Yeah. I did. I muted <laughs> myself. Uh, yeah, no, I was going to say, oh, yeah, for sure. Definitely um, paints a picture. And a couple of parts, especially with his guy. I, why? I can't remember his name. Did, it, did, is his name ever said? No, he's, it isn't said. Uh, okay, good. He yes, doesn't, so. he doesn't have a, a name. <laughs> all right. So the narrator, narrator, I just call like, him the narrator. all right. That, that's yeah. what I thought. Um, yeah. So I'm like, I, cause I didn't catch it, but he is very, obviously very self-involved narcissistic mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, but um, at the same time, I don't know. It's an interesting, strong character. So Cause you really, it, it gives you this like almost dreary backdrop over this guy's kind of, existence early on for me at least right um, i'm not sure if that was the the goal exactly but yeah i mean at the the, the first parts of the his the book like i mean semi spoilers i guess but like what the, yeah. before he kind of achieves some of his goals let's say and becomes like you know actually powerful um i wanted it to be kind of tragic comic where but but like without losing that kind of narcissism I, that he I has which that. is that like yeah like there i mean it's it's really dark dark if, if you know comedy if it's comedy at all but there are some moments i you know i at least laughed when i was writing them uh, like in the hotel uh and so on and then but then for the for the joke to like not be funny anymore at some point in the, in the book to be like oh okay like you know uh, whoa yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right no th- that was conveyed very well actually so I'm glad, I'm glad that i picked that up right so uh, it's good to know that like as a, as a reader sometimes i'm reading things in the right context uh because i i bounce back and forth uh from audio books in the car to audible along with reading it you know on uh, right YouTube. um so it was uh it, it, i i um i also there's a couple of times where I obviously couldn't listen to it at the same time where I just continued mm. reading it myself. Sure. Um, so it kind of, I'll bounce around sometimes like that. But the problem with that is obviously when I'm not listening to some of the narration um, mm. or whatever, I, I kind of lose um, some of the context there. So I'm glad that I picked that up correctly because uh, I, um, I really, I like that character as much as mm. it's really kind of, fucked up <laughs> i'll be honest <laughs> yeah. uh I, yeah. I i i really liked it a lot i mean mm-hmm. shit there's a lot of stuff that you're reading you know horror writers and and uh like lovecraft and stuff that's just fucking whoa yeah. uh, but this this was it, it just gets you on a more personal i i, I don't know human visceral level i guess just because it's so i don't know just ain't not angst but like this just I can't explain it, I guess. <laughs> I, I feel like for me, at least when I was writing it, I wanted to convey his like unresolvable frustration yeah. at some like aspect of reality. And when I say aspect of That's reality, I mean like <laughs> things that are ines- inescapable, like the fact that we need to use language to communicate, that you don't have immediate access to other people's thoughts, that um, you know, uh, you, you cannot freeze sort of time and space to give yourself the uh, the luxury to sort of figure out what's, what's the best way to move forward in this situation. Um, And and I think that that's really the sort of uh, underlying problem that that character has, Uh, which is cannot overcome it. Sorry. Um, Which is, is kind of interesting because we talked about earlier with boredom and -hmm. frustration and that really it, it it generates creativity Uh, frustration specifically. I think that's how we, you know, started 
uh, we created fire, you know, the wheel as, as a, as a, um, as a species, like we, we, it's through frustration that we create technology, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, make advancements. Um, and yeah, frustration, <laughs> use frustrated for sure. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and, and it was like that, but that, that, that unrelenting, unyielding manifestation, I guess is kind of what I was talking about earlier with, I mean, in some aspects, people do it in a positive sense and some mm. people it's, it's neutral and it doesn't even matter. Like they, they're just committed right. to what they think is, is the way to go. That's the only mm -hmm. way. And they're going to manifest as reality. And a lot of times they do. Um, right. Right. I E the president. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting that you, you say that because I, uh, you're not the first person to tell me that that was a theme that they sort of reson that resonated with them about that character. Yeah. Um, whereas honestly, it, it was one that was, uh, if anything, like a byproduct of the other themes I wanted to come. It wasn't something that was at the forefront of my mind while I was writing it, but that through other people's reactions, I can definitely, uh, I can definitely see. So that's interesting. Um, I didn't mean to uh, interrupt you and I no, do no, that quite often. Not at all. Um, I, uh, <laughs> not to, I don't want you know, um, you did, if you're not comfortable with talking about your writing process, I completely understand. No, that's so, um, totally fine. But do you, does yeah. it come from kind of like you have an outline at all or do you just, is it completely um, stream of consciousness type of um, manifestation? Um, um, or well, I would, I would say that, I'm, so first of all, this was my first novel and, and also my first uh, like serious piece of fiction. Uh, I know a lot of writers, um, like start with short stories and, and, you know, maybe have like other novels that they finish or something, but they never publish. And so for me, this was really uh, like, there were some failed attempts of things that I'd worked on in the past, but like, this was the first serious, like full length thing that I worked on. Um, so there were a lot of ways in which I began writing it that I, if I could go back and like, sort of, you know, tell myself, uh, give myself advice, I would sort of uh, to tell myself to do some things differently because I ended up wasting a lot of time having to do a lot of rewrites and so on. So I, yeah. what I'm about to say isn't necessarily like, a, uh, you know, the, what I would recommend, but what I did was I did have the uh, initial kind of very, very broad outline, which is to say just like the skeleton, like the, you know, what happens at the beginning, what happens at the end, and then a, a few plot points in the middle and um, the rest I sort of, uh, I filled in the details as I wrote, but I, uh, and, and I still think that that's sort of probably the, like the, like the books I'm working on now, I, uh, I'm more or less doing the same thing. Um, but I think at the beginning, I tried to, in the first draft, get something as good as it could be, which is to say that I kept sort of like rewriting sentences and, um, uh, like not finishing a, like a chapter just because I thought it wasn't very good and like re rewriting just that chapter or just like a, a paragraph over and over again when mm -hmm. in fact like that's that's I would say really not the right approach um, and but one thing that I did learn as I went on was I, I think of it as a bit similar to method acting which is like especially for the first personal narration parts but even some other parts is like I try to put myself in the character's you know right. position I think Coming like if, if I was, yeah, I mean, maybe not because uh, I still want to keep some distance from like a horrible, you know, person like the, sure, the, sure. the narrator, but like yeah. to some extent to think like, okay, if I'm in this person's shoes at this point in the story, what, what would, what would be going through their mind? What do they want? What are, what are their right. sort of goals? What are, how would they be thinking? And that's, yeah. especially because I like to focus on the psychological, um, well, and I mean, you can, you can get into that role and, mm -hmm. and, and mentally and, and know you could see, you can now almost empathize in a way with how a person could end up to right. a point. So I think that helps a lot and you don't have to really kind of dive too much into it. Like some people say, you know, Heath Ledger did or. Right. You know, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't at all say it's like anything like that, but just, I mean, to some, it was affecting. I mean, there are some things that happened in that book, which I, I won't spoil. They're kind of, uh, you know, messed up or. Yeah. Or tragic for some of the characters and, and it, you know even writing that did affect me that's, um yeah. that's, but uh, I, uh, that's awesome <laughs> actually yeah, I think yeah that, but you have that but would, connection but i would just say that like um like now the way that i would sort of say my writing process is, is that i i i have a bit more of a plan 
a bit more of a, uh, just to prevent myself from having to rewrite so much as I did. Um, it took me like three years just to, you know, get a complete working finished version of the measurements of decay. So for like novels I'm working on now, I try to have a bit more of a, of a plan in terms of the, of the plot and the themes and the, you know, what exactly is it that I am trying to write and come and, and get across um, and not care so much about the actual quality of the writing uh, in the first uh, first drafts or whatever, just to, right. even if it's trash and because you just, can go back and you know yeah exactly and that and that's something like. that I that I that I I think is really worth the time to go back and rewrite and to get right is the quality of the writing itself and maybe some characterization aspects and details like that but um, but to have the kind of major like goals and plot points and so on uh, I mean obviously one can always change things as as one's going but. To, to have that at least at the beginning, I think is more efficient. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, other, the other thing I would say is not to wait for inspiration. I think that's one thing that really helped me is like, I did a kind of experiment where I, at one point, uh, you know, would write something while inspired and take note of it and say, like put a little marker for myself and say, wrote this while like, inspired and had the, you know, I, 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 I think I, I, that you do music, I'm sure you experience this as well when you're very inspired. You, it, it feels automatic. It feels like it just kind of flows from you. That's and exactly that's a, right. It's a fantastic feeling and it definitely enables uh, like, you know, to, you to produce uh, work quickly. Um, but then I would sort of sometimes force myself to write and uh, treat it kind of like almost like a job. Like, okay, today I have to write this chapter or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I would go back later on like with some distance and notice that there wasn't really a difference in quality maybe like a very slight difference here or there, but that the real difference was like the motivation or the, the, the efficiency of how quickly I was getting done or whatever. And, um, and that's certainly beneficial, but I think a lot of people get stuck because they wait for inspiration. And I, I, I agree. I think that's, that's a mistake. For sure. Because you yeah. lose a lot of time in that. Um, yes. And I can definitely relate to that as a musician um, that's happened to me. Uh, a lot like where I um and even when, like I spent some time in between different types of music where I was playing guitar and singing in a band uh and then to being you know just a vocalist <clears throat> in a more aggressive and technical metal band which mm -hmm. was very different mm -hmm. than what I had done before uh, okay. but during that time I wasn't playing guitar like because all the stuff that I, I I write with a guitar that I'm playing and singing together uh, is stuff that I've had around for a long time. It's very personal to me. A lot of times written with an acoustic guitar. I'll translate mm -hmm. it to electric with the band, but um, distortion to try to emphasize it. So it sounds a little bit heavier, um, but acoustically, that's not usually how I write it. In that, in Unrest in Transit, I, I was only a vocalist. So I, I, at first I was uncomfortable uh, because, you know, uh, it's that kind of raw, like, I don't have the guitar anymore. It was just my security blanket, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I felt kind of almost exposed, but then it became the opposite uh, where I was very much into that. And the band behind me was kind of the security blanket and people really liked the music. And there's, you know, I felt I get into that kind of zone when we were writing. Um, but I have that much more when I write, with an, a, a guitar or an instrument myself or creating music myself it seems to flow more just autonomously like it just mm -hmm. um it, it's like that stream of consciousness it just comes out it's very mm -hmm. abstract sometimes um there's meaning to it for me but it's 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 more personal like i write it for myself and i know a lot of it is kind of confusing for some people and then they'll, but they'll make their own meaning out of it which is fine mm -hmm. with me because that's why i leave it open to interpretation mm -hmm. i'm not a big fan of literal music uh lyric writing i mm -hmm. think that you know it's it's just they're, they're painting a picture for you but it's very literal experience mm -hmm. that they've had you know what i mean where it leaves nothing to interpretation whereas i feel like artistic writing like bands like uh you know nirvana or uh, interpol or you know uh, radiohead uh even bands like Slipknot, for example, that mm -hmm. they, 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 it's much more abstract. It's much more open to interpretation, artsy, mm -hmm. so to speak. Right. Um, I, I like writing like that because that's where I'm giving it my most, but I wasn't mm -hmm. doing that while I was with the metal band. I didn't do it at all. I actually only focused in that. And I was really kind of 
it's kind of lazy about it, you know, and I had okay. to force myself to actually yeah. do it once in a while. And now uh, that habit kind of laid over to the point where I'm actually writing guitar and stuff in a band now. And I'm not writing a whole lot as much as I should be at home. So it's been a challenge of myself to try to challenge myself to do a little mm -hmm. bit each day. Um, which I think, uh, you know, it can be good because like you said, uh, the quality didn't vary uh, mm -hmm. as to whether you're, you're putting yourself into it uh, because you're really excited and passionate about it, mm -hmm. which is great because it comes smoothly. Um, yeah, right. But I think that it's important to challenge yourself and keep that creativity pushed to its max, mm -hmm. you know, um, because I think like what you've done in this novel um, and not, you know, not to, you know, say it was any specific thing. I'm not sure what, this is my interpretation of it. Uh, well, I guess more my appreciation of it um, is that in, if you did create any type of, you know, outline, uh, there's a very clear beginning and end and that's the ability for you to just kind of manifest stuff naturally in between all of that. Right. But the thing that I like the most is that because it has that everything ties really well together uh, even though it seems very natural uh, the character process and all that stuff that, that was very much a, a, a product of like rewriting and i i think at first like i was hesitant to maybe out of laziness i don't know but initially it was like oh like i don't want to you know completely overhaul the whole thing but i did that ended up doing that many times sure. and um and it, it ended up being, I think it's funny that you say that because I, I sometimes think like, uh, I don't, I don't really wish this, but I wish that my readers almost like knew the story before they read it, because there's so much in there that I, when I, I went back and, and rewrote it so much that you wouldn't really understand until you've read the whole thing. Um, and I'm glad, I'm glad that that like, at least comes That's across. true oh no it is it's so important you get to the very ending of that book yeah it's it's really it, ah man i like i all right so this is in no way to compare literature but i i i've read just about everything you know recently because i i really wasn't into horror so i thought mm -hmm. you know king was more horror so i got into stephen king and got really heavily into it and i love his writing because he you know it's very stream of consciousness he really doesn't have any outline and it's very chaotic which i can relate to but the problem becomes for me is that a lot of it is endings and i'm sure that's his biggest critique that he gets the most and some of them i really like um because it's i can relate to it in music but the difference here and what i really liked about it is i got that same feel of character structure and whatnot almost that you kind of just went with it and kept going and then you went back and kind of you know tighten things up a little bit which is what i would do as a musician right um, i i like that you had that that at least that linear point where everything kind of tied in really well together with the end um and it makes you think it makes you kind of and i'm sure some people who aren't into philosophy and technology and the integration of things. It's just really heavy topics yes, to make your mind spin in that book. Um, but that's why I fucking loved it, Ben. That, that engaged me in a way that I haven't had much other fiction do. Right. I, so, I really appreciate you saying that. Um, I, uh, I mean, I mean yeah. that genuinely because right. I've experienced that with things that are more referential data stuff that like mm -hmm. really just like, whoa holy shit you know some of the transhumanism stuff and all that it mm -hmm. makes you really go whoa but that i feel like you really very effectively tie that in um because look i'm a, i'm i'm a stoner like I, my brain's always been like very much outside of the box and it's very hard for me mm -hmm. to stay in the box in reality mm -hmm. as i'm existing now um but i have to now as a dad so there's that like balance mm -hmm. back and forth sure um, but in this this novel, uh, it really does a great job of conveying a lot of things, I think, to people who might not be as, uh, I guess, uh, versed in some of these topics. Um, I think that it, it definitely allows uh, for multiple readers, um, as long as they have the ability to be patient. Um, and I, I mean, I tell people this with a gunslinger all the time, which if 
you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's what me, pulled me into Stephen King, actually. Oh, wow. I, no, I, to be honest, I haven't, I don't think I've ever read a, a Stephen King novel. I don't know why. It's just I, never happened. You know, I, I've heard I that from a lot of people that are in, lit, that are heavy in literature. Um, mm-hmm. And I think a lot of times, for me at least, the only reason I didn't read it, anything other than it when I was younger until mm-hmm. now in my life. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm 36 now. It's like 34. I started reading Stephen King. Um, well, uh, okay. So aside from the gunsling, I started the first couple of those and then never got through it. And then mm-hmm. I read the rest of it. I just went back and read it and it's very fantasy sci-fi blend or whatever, but because mm-hmm. of all the integrated connections to this stuff, it really drew me in because it's, he's very much, uh, a visualized right like he creates like the same way you do in your novel it's very much a picturesque kind of thing you can visualize it and it transports you um which is kind of like a metempsy <laughs> you, you know that's what i like about novels and literature is that you you get into it and you experience other people's lives and experiences um and you know i i think that uh the thing that i um I think is important for readers is that, and the biggest complaint they have about Stephen King and any of the long, long novels is that, oh, well, there's too much about the character or there's too much about the thatched roof in Michael Crichton. But I think the thing to remember is the reason why the author is providing you that information is because it's very important. Well, as long as they're doing the job right, it's very important to the characters in the story. And that's why those little pieces that may be elongated, story character lines and stuff, um, where you have, you know, a pretty thick book. Um, it, once you get in, you can't stop reading. And I mean, but you've got to give it a little bit of time to get to that mm-hmm. point. It took right. for me to really get into uh, CL's storyline. I really, I love that. Um, for that uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that the, the risk paid off there. I think the one, my, my biggest fear um, in terms of like alienating readers was that the, the story is kind of fractured. Well, not kind of, it is very fractured at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And really, the, I, I, the only thing that could, I think, uh, keep people reading is like either curiosity about like how it comes, to, if, if or how it comes together, or um, I don't know, maybe just they enjoy the individual storylines. But uh I think I probably have alienated a lot of readers because like the first 150, 200 pages, uh, like the storylines are so fragmented. I can see that. Um, and I can see where the, the narrator story uh, can start off kind of seeming and don't take this the wrong way, but a sure. little kind of uh, like the characters self-involved and yeah, self-serving and sort of right. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, but it seems almost kind of long and like, and hard to kind of get into that character initially, but it becomes so important to the story that I, it, I really, I could see where people start to lose some interest, but if they right. get past that point, like the gunslinger, in my opinion, one of the best literary works of all time, people are, they get to that point and they're like, ah, the gunslinger kind of sucks. So I stopped. And it's like, you got to get past that. Right, like, right. Once you get past <laughs> that, you'll see why it's so important. And this, you can't always get that with people. Some people are just like, yeah, I'll wait till the movie comes out. And they're just like, <laughs> well, I, I have to say though, the worst like kind of reaction. I've, I don't, I, I mean, you know, not, nothing really phases me anymore, but like the, the worst yeah. reaction I've gotten is like people thinking that, um, that, I, that the narrator is somehow like my mouthpiece that I like endorse his views and yeah. Uh, you no. know, and it's just like, fuck no, he's uh, a character. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For hell. Yeah. <laughs> and I, yeah, I don't know. I don't even know what to say to that, but it's like, uh, yeah. What do you say to that? I would yeah, be like, I, uh, so you didn't get the, you didn't get it. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, the other, the other common reaction has been like, uh, which I understand. I think this is like the one I empathize with the most is like people hating the writing style um, for being a little too like ornate, which, yeah. uh, you know, that's a, like a taste thing, but mm-hmm. I, yeah, yeah. I, I guess I guess you're right. I I'm not as much of a a literary, uh, um, I guess. Uh, what's the word? I'm uh, not uh, not critique, but um, connoisseur. I guess I'm not I'm not so versed in literature that I know um, really. You know what is going to be traditional writing really phenomenal writing but to me it's it's if it's so well put together that 
you know, grammatically sounds beautiful and also paints a picture in my head um, that I can be really just kind of pulled into. I think that that's, um, that's what you should get from fiction. I, I can't understand why anyone would be looking for something more than that. Um, mm -hmm. I guess in, in that, in that, that perspective, the fractured thing though, is, is I think important to the story. Like it, it shouldn't mm -hmm. be, I can't imagine it any other way um, because of how it ties in together. And I'm sure that came after the fact, but I'm glad it did because it, it made for a really <laughs> cool, um, cool ending and storyline. Well, thanks. I, again, really appreciate, uh, I mean, your readership and your like, uh, appreciation of it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, and there's some things that look, I, I, I started, uh, and Anathem, um, and I, I struggle with it a little bit, whereas seven Eves, I didn't. Um, uh, but I think Anathem, it's going to be very apparent that that's another one you've got to really kind of stick out the early part of to get a little more. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm about 200 pages into that. And, uh, it's a lot of, uh, it's interesting because it's a lot, the, the world of that, of that, um, that book is not terribly different from our own, except in a few like nuanced, like, uh, or, or like obvious ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, there's like a lot of world building that goes on. Um, I love that. And, and novels. <laughs> and, yeah. And then, but then like, like the point I'm at where I'm at now, it's sort of like the, the plot is sort of ratcheting up. And I, I agree. It is, it is, I think one of those books that you have to be a bit patient with. Yeah, I, I, um, that and that's good because I uh, I think that the, the more the more I read about you know I read uh, the character backdrops and all that stuff and I really have the time to put into it and I don't get distracted by something else that pops up because of ADHD that's a, that's the hardest thing is that I'm just so scattered all the time it's like oh look at the oh shiny you know. Uh, uh, so like, uh, it's very hard to put in, you know, thousand pages, 2000 pages in a book, whatever it may be, you know, for really long reads, it, it can be tough to, to drive that through, but totally mm -hmm. worth it. Mm -hmm. Once you start to hyper-focus that, you know, wonderful ADHD trait too. So like scattered is a thing, but you can also really find yourself so enveloped in something that you're mm -hmm. like. I, did I eat today? No, I just read for like nine hours straight. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, um, th those things, I, I think, um, uh, for me, at least when it comes to reading a book, uh, can be challenging is getting into that right, right out of the gate. But I force myself through it because I know it's happened a ton of times with me. Heinlein is another author that, um, uh, if um, readers or yourself haven't uh, read any of his works, um, Robert Heinlein is a, is a really great sci-fi writer, but obviously it's, it was written a while ago. So you gotta kind of adapt that to the, the, the thought process behind reading it. But, um, you know, alternate history storylines and all that, um, it, it's, 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 it's good, good, uh, good reading, but same idea, like uh, Stranger in a Strange Land. Mm -hmm. Being into that book is a little a little tough to get into, but once you're into it, it becomes a very good, uh, very good story uh, that really, at least, made me want to read a lot more of it. Um, so Foundations, another one of those mm -hmm. um, that I I just found myself really all about, you know. That's funny. Foundation for me is kind of the inverse, where the beginning, at least for me, was like really absorbing, and I sort of was like immediately hooked in. But then as it went on, especially like uh, the second book, I had to like sort of uh, put a bit more effort into sticking with it. So I've only gotten through the uh, the first book. I haven't gotten okay. through the second second novel. I'm pretty sure I only did the first book. I, I have to look. It's tough because it's a lot of stuff I've read. And then I'm like, oh, wait, did I read the second? Like Dr. Sleep. I forgot that I had read Dr. Sleep. <laughs> <But> I'm, <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, I did read that. Um, yeah. And uh the um yeah that that the the world building in that with like that whole like city that you can't really see uh anything but um uh, you know, buildings and metropolis kind of uh that that i mean that really set the stage for that concept like the whole coruscant type planet uh mm -hmm. uh for uh <laughs> folks out there who aren't sure what coruscant is it's star wars city planet 
I guess this is the best way I can describe it. Heavily populated buildings everywhere, all over the planet. Um, kind of thing, uh, I think is, um, you know, kind of predates a lot of that sci-fi. Um, right. I, I just, it's interesting because there's a lot of those, I mean, you, you, you find people taking things from, you know, popular sci-fi and using it in mm -hmm. their own you know, stuff right. or influences, whatever. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just uh, I I really um, I like the, the 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 beginning of that uh, that novel too. Uh, I like it, but it was it was kind of hard for me to really kind of when they're getting into the discussion about uh, uh, history of the um, psycho history and stuff. yeah psycho history it was, that was tough yeah. Uh, yeah. for me at least, uh, which is surprising because usually I'm good at I'm good about <laughs> good about that stuff. Uh, but in the in that case, I, I had a little bit of a struggle. Um, but I, I did end up sticking it through and I was, I was happy I did because it's, it's a good, it's a good read, but I, it builds for another novel, obviously. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see right. that that's just going in that direction. Right. Um, so it is one of those kind of like less unsatisfied things, mm -hmm. uh, obviously. <laughs> um, have you ever read Dune? I have, yeah, I have read Dune. That was uh, one that I really liked. Uh, I did like it too, but uh... I don't know something about the, the the way it kind of. I think I like the beginning much more than the ending. The I ending. can't exactly say why. I, it, I mean, it's not it's not it's not that I disliked the book or anything. I, I quite liked it. Uh, there was just something a bit unsatisfying about the way it wrapped up, and I never read the second or third one. That, I was gonna yeah no to, I was gonna uh, say. Um, I, I I have a problem with books do that, and that's why I think yeah. we were just talking about in the, in, the, in the last novel is that it's like it's good to make a book like that and prepare for more books, but right, not everybody knows that that's going to happen. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so reading it standalone becomes yeah tough. I, mean, you, I would say it was better than some others I've read, which are like you know meant to be a series. Yeah, uh, I think it, like it was still like you know pretty self contained. It's just that um some things were left like unresolved or, or maybe resolved too quickly or something. Yeah. I, found that. I don't remember exactly, but, uh, but yes, I, I, I have read Dune. I like it. I mean, I, I yeah, I think that it, it, it definitely is, you know, it can be a standalone novel, but I think that there's some things that just, you get that, like that, um, that expecting feeling out of, mm -hmm. <laughs> out of the material. Um, uh, and I, I think that, and that's not a bad thing, uh, but I just, it's so rather it just be like a, you know, really long novel. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I'll just sit and just try to crush it. But that's like binge watching Netflix, right? Some people sure. are not into that and other people right. can wait, you know, episodic uh, novel releases and mm -hmm. all that, which isn't my jam. I uh, I do like short stories. Uh, mm -hmm. Um but yeah yeah i i prefer things that ha uh, wrap up i uh, you know have a definite uh, satisfying ending it seems like things wear out they're welcome when they just go on and on uh right yeah. i agree um i you know and i i think that you could have like a well for me at least i, I don't mind the more tragic kind of like discordant endings that are just kind of <laughs> like because it just gives you the taste of kind of reality sometimes people hate that mm -hmm. yep. shit. there's a lot of readers out there that yes. hate it hate it they want happy <laughs> yeah. endings all the time and for yeah. me i i don't mind that uh as long as it's wrapped up kind of reasonably mm -hmm. and makes sense um but short stories specifically um there's a couple of things that i i i, I kind of like that are the end kind of jarring mm -hmm. um one of the best short stories I've ever read um, it was um, not actually it's 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 a tough one. I would say after the bombs by Richard Chismar is one of the. It's a very impactful. I, and I think I personally, you're gonna have a bias on this, right? I'm a dad, so there's this connection in the book to. Um, uh, to characters and 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 whatnot this is relationship uh to um you know characters who die and stuff that it's just it, i i hope i didn't give anything away now i'm thinking about it. but there's uh there's it's a great read and and it, and it really got to me in a way that i didn't expect um and uh yeah i think one of the the best short stories that i've read um and 
I'd say pretty, pretty close to that. Well, I don't know if it's considered a short story or not. Um, and I, you know, I can't even remember the name of it. Uh, I mean, another one by Lovecraft. I was thinking of Lovecraft, but uh, mm. I, I, the color out of space was a really interesting mm-hmm. read. Have you ever read that? Yeah, I, uh, I have read quite a bit of Lovecraft. Uh, I think, I think Lovecraft inspired me in, a, in some like more subtle ways in, uh, uh, in my own writing. Uh, but I, I think I always, it's funny. I always thought that Lovecraft's monsters were like a metaphor for, for uh, like, I mean, obviously not the, a, a metaphor only, well, not just like, I think it could be a metaphor for many things, but one of the things I always sort of read into it is like, uh, like intellectual arguments that get like, you know, interlocked and go <laughs> and like, yeah, uh, get, yep. get sort of, uh, so, uh, I don't know, labyrinthine that it, it's like a, like a maddening process to sort of like, uh, uh, yeah. and in, so, in some ways that's like the psychology of the psychological horror. Yeah. In my, yeah. In my, in my own novel is sort of, I, I was the, the image I would try to, I think there's even a, like a mini dream sequence where he sort of like faces the Lovecraftian tentacles in his own psychology. Yeah. That, 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 yep. that's sort of what I, what I always thought of when I, when I read Lovecraft that it's, that's, I didn't draw yeah. those parallels until now. So that's, that's really awesome. That gives a whole other, uh, a lot of things kind of click uh, there when you tell me that. So that, that's, that's cool. That's really awesome. Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, so I, I, I do, I do really like Lovecraft and it's, it's cool. Cause I think you can like, ascribe that metaphor to many different things like like you said it could be like um i don't know the especially just that tentacle theme of things wrapping and looking monstrous and uh, you know incomprehensible yeah. and then when you the, the mere fact of looking at them sort of drives you a little, <laughs> a little mad just, right uh, it just it's mind-boggling you can't yeah, even uh, register it it's so in- yeah horrific uh, that there that there's a, a lot of horrible things let's say in the world that uh or things that, that can evoke that kind of horror. And I, I, that's what I think I appreciate the most uh, about him. Yeah, I, 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 I also, you know what, I, sorry, it's just one no, other thing. No. The, only, the thing I really quite love about Lovecraft, which I think is probably best exemplified in The Call of Cthulhu, yeah. is how the scale of the story uh, expands. Because uh, it always starts out like almost comically, like, a, you know, it's like a little bust of some like, ancient deity and you know in some scholar's office like that gets delivered like that's how it starts you know it's yeah. like a, yep. and then like you know the next Always. thing it's like uh, some some you know tribe somewhere in the world is like gone crazy and are doing sacrifices or you know human sacrifices and then by, you know by the end of the book the world is like being consumed uh, right. and everyone's mad and the cosmos is involved and i i think that has influenced me too that kind of the way that um the scope and scale of the story kind of expands uh yeah that's uh i think that's um that's something that kind of really attracts me to a lot of fiction that can effectively do that that can mm-hmm. kind of start out small and then just cascade into something right. bigger um which is is i can imagine a tough thing to do as a writer like i can't even imagine you know trying to you know just I mean, world building is one thing, but that kind of just explosion of, of storyline is, uh, mm-hmm. is, is just, is very unique. Um, and I think that whenever, well, like even at a small, a small spectrum, like the color out of space, how it just kind of spreads out, same kind of idea, mm-hmm. um, impacting and infecting everything. Um, but that psychological, Dis, disconnection like it's a, a color that brain can't mm-hmm. can't connect to like it, it can't register right that uh but that like how it infects everything including oh man i mean if you haven't read Lo- lovecraft by now sorry spoiler alert uh infects yeah. the family and all that yeah, like yeah. the way that happens um is just it's the same. The same as a lot of his writing. It just kind of cascades and right. uh, in, in a very unique way. Um, so it's it's kind of interesting you brought that up because I, I I didn't really look at uh, the color of space that way, but definitely some of his other you know larger works um, 
in that light where it, it, you know, but the color out of space, same idea. It starts out with a, yeah, a meteorite, you know? Right. And then it's just, always some, some small scale thing that like by the end, like the whole cosmos is implicated. I really, yeah, I, th- I think really like that, uh, that technique that he has, which is like, as I said, influenced me a lot. That's amazing. Cause, and, and it makes a, a lot of, it draws a lot of, um, I guess parallels or makes a lot of connections uh, now. Um, so I'm probably going to read it again now. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> because I do that a lot with, uh, with, with books. Um, like I've read the dark tower series like mm-hmm. four times now. Um, and it's funny because there's really only like, uh, like a four books that I really heavily like in the series mm-hmm. but I do like the whole story and so I just force myself through it when I you know I'm just like well it's been a while and then it takes me you know a couple of months right <laughs> uh, but it's I, I I like I like reading like that I like because in the second time around with any book you pick up on other things that you didn't catch before and um right but I can see um where like that psychological facet um, that because it is something that's so jarring a lot of times in Lovecraft that it's really mm-hmm. like it's ugh, you know you get that like disquiet kind of all oh, right um, I think that I kind of get some of that that same feel actually disquiet would be the word I would say I get from the material Metempses, which I said earlier in the, the the show and didn't explain what it was to listeners. Right, uh, I'll let you explain it better than me. He wrote it. Um, well, so so uh, Metempse in the in the novel is a, um, I guess the closest thing would be a video game, uh, but that's accessible directly from your own mind. So that like whenever you want, you can enter into a kind of uh, hallucinatory simulation of you know, some kind of fantasy or whatever it is that can last as long as you want and, or, or at least feel as, as though it lasts as long as one wants. Um, and that everyone who has this device called a procrustus uh, in their brain uh, can, has access to. And it's sort of like the main form of entertainment that the society in the future and, and my book sort of engages in. Uh, and it's, it's overwhelmingly like what most people spend their time doing. Um, is that a good I would say absolutely here. perfect okay. description. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, and and the, I mean, the thing that that's really um, big there, like you were saying, is that, um, and it, I mean, I'd say even, you know, it isn't a form of entertainment, but it's almost like uh, it's so much it's like they, 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 it's so self enveloping that mm-hmm. they, they just there isn't anything other than that for a lot of them. That's right. all they're experiencing is these fake realities. Mm-hmm. Um, so it becomes like, like all, their whole lives are just entertainment. So it's right, like, right. Uh, yeah, and I, I think that um, that uh, well, uh, I, don't, I don't want to spoil anything, but yes, yeah, to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there, are, there are characters that that uh, go down the rabbit hole in a bad way in, in that in the book. Right, and uh, I yeah, I mean that makes for really phenomenal reading, by the way. Oh um, well, yeah, I'm glad to. Yeah. I, I I I I mean I. I kind of attached to that kind of stuff that other readers may find to be mm-hmm. different. Uh, <laughs> for me, I, I, I definitely um, uh, get into, but I mean, I think it's part of the getting into the characters and just become relating to the characters the same way you become character partially when you write it. I think the reader gets to experience that too. That can, right. I mean, at least for me, you can relate to some things or see how somebody could get to a certain point. Um, and it, i mean sometimes stuff like that helps you make your own self recognitions right things like and even in pop culture like you can just mm-hmm. um but literature i think is it's it's much more implanting or you know uh and well i just wanted to say one thing about lovecraft just before we move on there was oh, the yeah. um you mentioned the sense of disquiet uh that you get from him I think that that the story I think that really has that the most for me at least is the Shadow over Innsmouth. Um, I actually I haven't you, read that. Okay, I won't spoil it then. But it's it's uh it it really does that that uh, I think I can't remember I, I don't remember who said it, but there was a good distinction made between horror and terror, uh, where horror is something sort of like um, unanticipated or out of the out of the ordinary that 
you know, surprises you in a, in a bad way. Um, whereas terror is where everything seems as it, you know, as, as normal, but but there's something off that you can't quite put your finger on. Uh, where the, it's 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 the very normality of the, like uh, that. There's something on, uh, either overlaying or underlaying the normality of things that kind of uh, terrorizes you, and that in some way that's a deeper form of like um, wow of disquiet. Uh, and I and I really think that he manages that in some of his stories, uh, like The Shadow of Rinsman. Wow, that that's uh, I, you know I I um I haven't really thought about it that way, and that's that's interesting um, because like. Pet Cemetery um, for readers out there, obviously, uh, <laughs> most people have read it. Another spoiler alert, but um, in the book, kid gets hit by a uh, uh, sixteen wheeler or whatever on this very busy road. They move there or whatever, and it's just like there's a scene in that book from the perspective of a parent. Um, it's just utterly horrifying uh it, or i would say horrific like you can't you you just like as a it, it, but on a level that it's 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 weird because it's it's not like a like a I mean, it is a visceral level because it's really descriptive and, and rough but uh on that level that you just can't even imagine and 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 i read it twice like when i was younger and then when i got older and big difference between i can imagine yeah how i have <laughs> as a father i'm just like oh God, yeah, yeah. I just, I, I just like my whole inside just felt awful, and I just like, I didn't even want to like. I, it was a real uncomfortable mm -hmm. feeling for a good, like, good, good, good amount of time after I, uh, you know, got in and throughout the book, you know, which mm -hmm. is is good in its own way. But I'm not usually heavy into horror, so right, uh, yeah, me neither. Actually, I think fantasy so. Maybe stuff. Day. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm not actually a, a big horror fan myself. I I think some people might find that surprising because uh, there are some aspects of my novel that are uh, like definitely horror uh, could be described as horror. But I <laughs> I myself don't really uh, I, I'm not a big horror reader. I read some like 18th century, I mean sorry, 19th century horror like gothic horror, mm -hmm. um, Dracula. Um, uh, Mel Moth the Wanderer, things like that, but mm -hmm. uh, it's it's more that I appreciate the, the themes and the writing style and the, the horror itself. Uh, and I definitely don't read much contemporary horror at all. So that's uh, you know it's it's interesting because yeah. I was never I I one uh, and it's kind of a lot of people are like mm. uh, I don't really I can't get into Clive Barker. I've I've read okay you know, uh, the Hellbound Heart. I've read a few things. I just I it's not my jam. Like I'm not into mm -hmm. it. I don't really like it. And I kind of associated Stephen King with that initially. Okay. I did read Pet Cemetery when I was younger, mm -hmm. but I'm like, ah, it's gonna, it, you know, it's a lot like that because Pet mm -hmm. Cemetery is a rough novel, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, but it's not like the rest of his work. So when I actually went back and uh, oh, did you lose? Uh, lost yep, I am. Visual. I got to change the battery over that. Uh, for all the listeners out there, uh, but basically what i'm saying if i can if you can hear me um, yeah I, I can still hear you is uh in the uh in a lot of clive barker is a lot of that visceral the midnight meat train is very gory kind of you know stuff and i'm not saying that you know pet cemeteries like that because it's much more of a psychological uh mm -hmm. facet to it um what i didn't see uh, is I assume that everything else is going to be like that. And most, I, I, I don't even understand how people, maybe I am, again, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a literary layman, right? I don't know much about uh, literature, but I don't understand how he's classified as a horror writer when most of it's fantasy fiction, to me at right. least. Uh, it's not at all really that horrific, except for certain aspects. But like your book isn't a horror book and it has, some parts like you said um that are, are jarring or or uh, you could uh chalk it up to uh horror influence i i definitely find it interesting uh how everybody's just got on the same page that the like carry not that's not really a horror novel to me in any way uh right maybe just like psychological but not uh but in the sense of like yeah um some but like still it's not i don't know like it's it's weird like even like 
uh, uh, like Christine uh, has some parts that's very, you know, ghost story like, so I can see that. Um, but uh, it, it highly recommend re uh, to read that if you ever get a chance because you like Lovecraft. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, he's heavily influenced by Lovecraft. Um, okay. And it's very cosmological horror. Um, and there's some things about it that are flawed, you know, because the amount of cocaine mm -hmm. he was on. But <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I love the book. I think it's great. It's one of my favorite reads. Um, and a good character study stories. Um, and, and if I think it really, you can see a lot of his uh, Lovecraft influences in that. Um, for me, at least, uh, I could connect that. So, I, I, if you ever get a chance, uh, it's something that you know. Oh, so, thanks, guys. It's on the I, bestseller I'll, list. I'll look into no, it. <laughs> okay. I, but it's 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 one of those things that I didn't. I read a little bit when I was younger, but it was so big I never got into, and I didn't read until now. And I'm like, wow. I've been sleeping on this, man, because I, right. <laughs> I, uh, I used to dig into you know less fiction, I guess, than I am now. Mm. Um, and a lot of it was Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke and Heinlein and, you know, the old, you know, kind of uh, lunchbox, <laughs> I call it you know, lunchbox sci-fi magazine. Okay, yeah, right, That's yeah. what I think <laughs> of uh, when I, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, when I was younger, it was uh, those little small magazines that had all the little writing is what got me into a lot of those writers. Um, I just got a bunch of them from... You know, hand me downs and stuff. So, um, and if I knew what I, then what I knew now, when I hung on to some of those that were worth money, now right. <laughs> serious money. I had like Stephen King short stories, like The Jaunt was in one of them, uh, oh, wow. and uh, I think it was The Jaunt. It was one of his short stories was was in it. And now that little magazine fetches some cash in the condition it was in when I threw it out. <laughs> uh, it's funny how books are. <laughs> They are uh, the retained value based on, you know, limited availability and all that stuff. Um, I've recently got into collecting a few things, but I'm trying to keep it small because I, you know, I know how I am with ADHD and impulsivity. So, right. you know, I was like, oh, I have to have this. I really don't have to have this at all. It's just another belonging that it will eventually find its way back to entropy. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, I, um, I, uh, I definitely uh, like the fantasy fiction stuff, which I don't really get into like, like I like Lord of the Rings, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, I read it when I was younger, but, and I, you know, the movies and all that stuff, like now I would have to, I wouldn't read it again. Like I would the Dark Tower or like I would read your novel or like, there's certain things that I've like, and not to discount it in any way, but I'm not big into elven, you know, elves and and um, and uh, why can't I think of it? Jeez, dwarves and all that. Like I was when I was younger, uh, and of course, is it because it's like um, it's it, it, well, what I, why I would ask? It's weird because it's curiosity. a nostalgia thing. I love nostalgia, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, people in this you know millennial uh category are just like full of nostalgia right i, I right on the you know generation x millennial you know bridge there where <laughs> nostalgia definitely like i i will i'll go back and play old school video games like i want to watch movies from when i was younger i want to read books from when i was younger um so it is surprising to me that i don't um, like I just read Tales for the Bounty Hunter the other day, not because it's great writing, because it's definitely not. No offense, I shouldn't say that. It's not. That's not great writing. It's. I I love it for these reasons because I love Star Wars and because I love the stories uh, uh, in it. You know, because I was mm -hmm. I'm a nerd and I I just there was nothing but the original trilogy when I was a little kid until the prequels came out when I was like 13. Um, mm -hmm. So from like 10 to like. 13 i was reading like you know tales of the bounty hunter and all these you know older you know early 90s i think novels that were uh, considered canon now disney scrapped all that to the dismay mm -hmm. of all the fans and even george lucas um but it is what it is they're trying to 
they're doing a pretty good job retying it. Some of the, some of the uh, those video games, the Star Wars video games, had some really good uh, stories in them. Actually, better yeah. than the, some of the movies, in my opinion. But like, I, uh, I agree. It is a shame. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Um, especially back in like, was it? Oh, why can't I think of the name of it? I had like my favorite character. Night, Knights of the Old Republic. Knights of the Old Republic is a great one. I'm thinking yeah. of it was it was N64 uh, Shadows oh, of the okay. Empire. Okay. Uh, with Dash Rendar, it takes place in between. Empire is it with Strikes the Back Kyle and... Katarn character? Um, I remember that from when I was a kid, but I oh my god, Kyle! Katarn. I don't remember then. No, that's oh my god! What was that? Yes, that's Je- uh, Jedi Jedi Knight. I think it was the name Jedi, of the game. Jedi Knight. But there's what... a, but there was one that was before or Dark that. Forces. No, it's Dark, Dark Forces. Yeah, I think I think I think Dark Forces is the first one. Uh, Kyle Katarn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was that yeah. was an awesome game. I remember yeah. playing that. So I, I just can't remember what the name, the name is. Yeah. Uh, that was an awesome game uh, for the time. Now yeah. compared to what they have now, it's yeah. you know not uh, I guess uh, up to the the par of most gamers nowadays. But for me, I mean, again, nostalgia. I I really like uh, the those things from my childhood that i because people want to go back to that you know things are less stressful uh but but i I would i would really um uh you know recommend i mean i i hear you about what you're saying about um it sort of being colored by your childhood and nostalgia but if you haven't i would definitely read uh the silmarillion uh tolkien's the silmarillion which is sort of like the uh the, uh, I have not uh, read that massive, massive yes. prequel to uh, Lord of the Rings. It's very, it's quite different, and in, in my opinion, it's like you know much better. No, I mean, which is I, I I quite love Lord of the Rings, so I so does it this, just say does something. It take place in between the Hobbit and no, no, it takes place uh, like thousands of years before before um, the Hobbit, the Lord of the Rings. Uh, yeah, even before the Hobbit. So the okay. way it um, it's in a way, it's a bit like the opposite of. Uh, of uh of what i was talking about with uh, lovecraft where it yeah. starts the scale of the story starts small and then expands like you know it's it's quite the opposite it starts with like the creation of the world right like massive huge like scope <laughs> and like the oh, you wow. know uh and then um i mean this is how i think of it it starts out as like theology or cosmology right how the world begins and so on it's like one chapter mm-hmm. then it like slowly talks about uh uh the kind of gods or angelic forces that are that, that, that govern that world uh middle earth or not just middle earth but arda and it um it becomes kind of like mythology the way he he writes it and then little by little it becomes more and more like uh, short stories about characters that uh progress the st- like narrative of the world itself and i think it's like phenomenally well written i think better than much of the Lord of the Rings in terms of like the writing style, but also the themes are like very, um, very moving in my opinion. Like it's about the nature of evil and like how lying is intrinsically, uh, uh, like uh, is intrinsic to the notion of evil. Uh, and uh, I mean, there's some stuff in there that's quite dark, like uh, compared especially to like the Lord of the Rings. And I, I, you know, I know you said you don't like the, fantasy themes of like elves and stuff but it's it might it well, might change your I, I mind i do yeah. i just it's 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 tough for me now uh sure, as sure. older but i i know i'm definitely gonna have to dig in it because it's it's on the list right mm-hmm. but it's like something it's like a triage list right <laughs> um and it's tough <laughs> because i've got these things on that i really want to get to sure um and uh it yeah it just um it's tough because i i definitely uh oh what is going on with the hey, there we go Let's see if I can bring this back. Um, nope, that's down. So we're back there. Sorry for the viewers and out there. The listeners aren't going to be impacted by this, obviously, but having some technical difficulties. Um, there we go. And uh, I guess where I've, I, I uh, oh yeah, triage list. <laughs> um, all of, you know, anything that goes on this list that I want to read gets kind of like kind of bumped out by something will pop into it. And it gets worse obviously with ADHD, but that's something that I actually have had on the list for a while because I obviously I've read all the other stuff when I was younger. And then part of the trilogy when I was a little bit older um, around the times that the movies came out, um, to kind of like freshen myself up on some things I didn't remember. And then I never got back through it all the rest of the way. So I should read it again now that I'm, you know, 
I'm older and, you know, I have yeah, I mean, a little I think bit more some attention. Of the, some of those themes are also pretty, um, like, I don't, I haven't found those themes in, in many other books. Like, for instance, like, there's a real sense in Tolkien of, like, the sub, sublime aspects of the world, like the feeling that uh, the world is kind of imbued with this, like, divine sublimity. Uh, and and that's, it's something that I don't really, I, other fantasy writers try to uh, to grasp at that. And it's, I, I quite like it because it's a very stark contrast to the world we live in, where I think it was like the sociologist, uh, Max Weber, who said like, we live in a disenchanted world, right? Where, yeah. Uh, I mean, part of that is like the disenchanted by science's progress and so on. But just in general, there's, there's it's hard to feel uh, like a connection, you know, to, to, to the world in, in the sense that maybe our ancestors did. And I think that, I think Tolkien really manages to evoke those feelings. I, um, I really, that makes me really want to kind of bump it up the list again. I'll probably go. <laughs> and because the thing is, I like to read things in, in order and whatnot. So uh -huh. this would take place before the Hobbit, right? It's the it's like the first, it, it, it takes, sure. the, I mean, this, the narrative first of the, the story order, is right? it's, yeah, it's first in the reading order, but in addition, it's like it, this narrative of the book itself takes place over thousands of years. So it's, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm on board with it. That, that's, that's yeah. really awesome. I'm yeah. glad we got to talk about it because I, yeah. I, um, I definitely have uh, wanted to kind of read it again. And for, you know, listeners out there who haven't read it, um, that are, you know, literature uh, folks, um, I would find it very unlikely that they haven't <laughs> read uh, <laughs> Tolkien, but I highly recommend those books, even though uh, my connection to fantasy is a little trouble. It's less, I think less with his style of writing, but more so stuff that kind of came after it in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. And not even just that type of fantasy, like uh, Game of Thrones, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I read the first two and I couldn't really... I don't know. I don't know what it is because there's heavy character building and story backgrounds and every, everybody thinks I'm crazy. Uh, but I just, I, I don't, I, I actually I don't know. didn't really like, uh, I mean, I enjoyed the TV show for a while. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, I couldn't enjoy, I didn't like the, uh, the books to be honest. I, I have reasons which I don't really want to get into, but like I, yeah. it wasn't for me. So yeah. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. I, you know, it's funny cause I, um, I, uh, kind of felt the, the same way, uh, at least in the aspect of, um, liking one versus the other i like the tv show actually quite a bit and i ended up sticking it all the way through and i could give a shit less of how the books are going to end and the fact that they mm -hmm. ended the season without you know there being books out to you know it line up with but mm -hmm. i i kind of like the show i didn't i couldn't really get into um i don't know i don't know if it was the the story that that the so much storyline and so many characters that was really hard and if you didn't know like background of the targaryens it was like there's so much there that oh. it isn't a terrible thing that it, it is that way, but it, it started to actually pull away some of my interest which usually yeah, i mean the case I, yeah i gotta stuff, be honest for me for me it was the uh the writing style which can happen yeah. with me sometimes like if the uh, if the writing style i feel isn't like what is it like what I'm looking for? I get turned off. Uh, right. Even if it's like otherwise, you know, got other merits. Mm -hmm. uh, but that would, that's just me. I, I know. I agree. Yeah. Um, there's some things that like, I, um, I know um, are great masterpieces of literature, even that I can't, <laughs> I just, it's not, it's not something I can really, I can do it. Like Moby Dick read it really didn't like it that much. <laughs> oh. read the whole thing <laughs> Herman Melville I know I should like it and I everybody is like what it's a literary masterpiece and I agree but it's still yeah. it's a, like, hard it's a taste thing yeah, yeah it's a taste it was a hard thing for me to get through I guess um and even it's trying to do it a for, second time for me I, I mean I, I I think like uh I mean I love I love Moby Dick and I think it's the uh without being like hyperbolic i think it's like objectively maybe the best book in the english language that i like original english language book that i've read it's it's my second favorite one but it's i think like objectively the best one um so from like uh, a cellar door 
perspective you know do you know what i mean what, by a solo uh, door no no oh, like that that's like objectively the most pleasant word or something and yeah 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 so like that, yeah, yeah, the yeah. literarily um be- beautiful uh, or do you mean that like the story and everything is really i think everything i mean there's so so much about it i could like talk about it for a long time but the uh but i i and it's funny because i know it has a reputation for being like very dense and certainly there are parts of it that are very dense especially like at the sentence level mm-hmm. but um that the chapters are so short that like i remember when i was reading it it was like it, it the pace was really nice i mean this is i mean obviously you, know, you don't agree with me about this but like um yeah no i i just uh i actually i really quite love moby dick uh i mean yeah. so i mean i i don't think it's it's terrible uh, my thing sure. is just like it's it's hard for me to get uh to get pulled into which is totally sure. like a you know a in my opinion, kind of a, a superficial reader thing, because right. for a lot of people, it's like, what entertainment do you have to feed me now? You know, what oh, I mean? okay, yeah, yeah. and for me, like, I totally actually can kind of relate to that when it comes to books, because I mean, there's an amount of necessary thinking there for me that like, is really important. Um, like being uh, conscious of what's going on in the story, um, mm-hmm. being conscious of the the writing itself and how it you know, paints a picture. Um, but I, for me, I guess sometimes it's just like, um, I guess I struggle with this with Mary Shelley too a little bit, um, where, I mean, great writers, right? I cannot discount their writing for that in any way, nor would I. Um, but it's it, hard for me to, really get into and visualize even though it's it's mm-hmm. well described and mm-hmm. i don't know it's i think yeah, it's, again it's, it's probably a, just... a personal thing or sure. maybe an adhd thing too um because if i'm not interested in something and it mm-hmm. doesn't like captivate like an interest mm-hmm. uh, like uh, weirdly appliances it's a profession i did for a long time for some reason I, I interest of mine but other things i don't know it's it's weird uh because certain things i just I, uh, I bind to and uh, other things it's like uh, I get to a certain point I'm like I can't do it I yeah. just you know tuck tail you know. <laughs> oh yeah I understand that that's uh... I think that's with anything though right with music yeah. yes. uh, um, and I mean that because I'm incredibly picky and all over the place with music it's weird mm-hmm. like I listen to, like Coldplay oddly enough I'm not a super fan of you know more popular stuff but and i listen to really like weird aggressive technical metal and like but then there's certain things in those you know genres that i just right i'm like no way i, I can't can't do it <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> um i like uh, uh i like weezer but i don't like i can't think of the name of the uh cars in the front yard i can't remember the name of the song uh but it's uh it's terrible it's a terrible pop song from that same time <laughs> uh as like weezer and i just i it's like very alternative rock but just super ugh, like uh-huh. butt rock ugh, man i can't i can't stand generic soulless like that you can tell that it's just pumped out to make money yeah made by a machine for machines <laughs> yes, exactly that's yeah. exactly right um <laughs> i can't i can't think of a better way to word it that's exactly yeah. right like it's just let's generate something that's gonna generate money and then they'll do it with you know boy bands they'll do it with rock bands like even not to discount lincoln park all the lincoln park fans out there but that band was ultimately indirectly but directly created by a record company mm-hmm. put people with talent together to make a band but it's like when stuff comes out and the intention is to sell records yeah. and to market it a certain way. And it, there's just such a lack of like heart for me. I don't know. Again, no, I, I actually, uh, you know, when it comes to music, I completely agree. I mean, there's that, that kind of music I can, I feel as though I can immediately identify it. And my, my mind just like rejects it immediately. Yeah. Uh, so I quite understand what you're saying. The genuine, um, facet of like the the gen uh, what's the word i'm looking for the the disingenuousness of 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 pop a lot of pop or just regurgitated Mm -hmm. you know manufactured stuff versus the very authenticity of Mm -hmm. um 
a lot of times people are very depressed, <laughs> drug addicted. Uh, sure. You know, the, the, the art artists, I hate to say it, but it's just a cliche for a reason. Like I luckily consider myself uh, lucky in the aspect that I'm not, you know, um, struggling with substances and stuff to uh, make art uh, specifically. Uh, but I see a lot of that in the creativity um, community when it comes to art and the need mm -hmm. to, um, it's just that erraticness that I feel like musicians attach to sometimes a lot of drinking, a lot of mm -hmm. drug use from time to time. Um, but because of those things, um, I think that like the artistic Kurt Cobain's of the world, they struggle, uh, mm -hmm. and that pain comes out in their music, that, mm -hmm. that struggle, that just raw human humanity comes out through their music and people eat it up. They, mm -hmm. they fucking feed off it like vampires it's, it's yeah. weird almost in a way yeah. uh how somebody can just take somebody's artistic like pain and, and connect to it in some aspects and then you know regurgitate it on the radio until it's unlistenable right. um, and i think that the that that the authenticity pays off a lot more long term bands yes. for me like i i not sure your musical preferences, but uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Deftones, uh, but they... Uh, I, I am, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I like them a lot as a band, uh, mainly for the fact that they've stayed kind of genuine to themselves, like Tool. Mm -hmm. They've always kind of done their own thing, stayed consistent with their own thing, and kind of had their own, you know, artistic... I've, I've liked their, uh, their last few records quite a bit, actually, more than the early ones. I know that's maybe not... Uh... No, I've uh, heard that actually a lot from uh, from people, um, especially people who like like Radiohead or mm -hmm. or the more artistic um, genres. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. They've definitely identified more with the recent stuff, yeah. which I can understand that too because I like it a lot. <laughs> it's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but uh, no, no, I, no, I definitely just... I dig the Deftones a lot. So it's it's, yeah. it's cool that uh, we got to kind of get into music a little bit. Um, yeah. They, uh, well, it, it was a. Uh, I mean, I, I, in some ways, I feel like um, music was as inspirational or infl I mean, to me as like a, you know, when I write, um, maybe more so in the past than now. But like, I did. I, I think there are certain moods and like ideas or feelings or whatever you want to call it that come out of music. That um, yeah, music evokes for sure. Yeah, that has Definitely. inspired me as much as, as uh, other books or movies or whatever. Well, that and, and memories and, and experiences yeah. that attach themselves to the music yeah. too. It's it's very interesting how the brain does that and the correlations yeah. that we make between uh, memories and like I think of this song and I think of that time. It transports me back yeah. to that time, you know. Um, which I mean, fr frequently when I'm like doing any kind of work, not just uh, writing, I uh, I like need to put some kind of you know music on just to stimulate my mind. Uh, yeah at least at the outset then maybe i'll turn it off after an hour or something but just uh that uh it's funny because as a musician <laughs> you'd think that that's kind of relatable listen to music to write music right. uh, but a lot of times if i'm listening to music it char charges things to the point where i'm like i really should be writing music like okay not yeah. that i'm like <laughs> you know in contest with anybody but it's like why am i not putting more time into music there's a yeah. lot of things that just pop into my head while i'm listening to other bands and i'm like oh you know you should integrate this type of uh you know it, it's something that will happen in the song which will lead to a completely unrelated thought mm -hmm. <laughs> uh which will be very uh conducive to writing so right um that's it's cool that music does that uh mm -hmm. I, for me at least uh super super important um to me i heard there's a um uh, a a musician i quite like he's like a metal um producer as well as a i don't know if you've heard of the band kralis they I uh haven't, but i'm now going to write it down right now because i have a ongoing music list like like reading list yeah uh, uh, no, how's this spelled k-r-a-l-l-i-c-e uh like alice but with like two l's and a kr at the beginning um huh and he said something that was very interesting once i, I don't i actually tried to find that interview this guy's called colin marston he's a he's a uh 
a pro he, he like he, he produces a lot of records as well as uh, being involved in music but um and, and like I, you know making music yeah but um uh, I, I watched an interview of his once and I couldn't find it again but he said something like that he thought music was the most abstract art and that it has uh, a kind of power in, in being so abstract because it can it, it, like so like you can't change the meaning of a word on a, on a, on a page but um, but like a, you know a piece of music putting aside lyrics but just like the musicality of, of, uh, of like a song um, can attach to someone per more like personally because it's so abstract it has more like uh, space for you to like sense. insert insert yourself if, or, or something like if that makes sense i'm, I'm probably but no, uh, no 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 i mean well if you me. are i wouldn't know but because yeah. it makes it makes sense to me it definitely uh yeah. it makes a lot of sense actually because when it comes to writing or lyrics when i hear certain lyrics or you know words like we were talking about uh with like ai and like programs ability to recognize a word love being a meaning or you know the word or the connection the word implies our experiences our past experiences and relationships and love uh you know the, my experience with my mom loving me is versus somebody else's mom you mm -hmm. know beating them or you know what i mean like that's it varies yeah. everybody's yeah. definition uh, but i think that um that becomes really important with music because everybody's connection is going to be different. Everybody gets something different from it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and for me, abstract is the way I try to write because it just embraces the fact that music is kind of abstract. Well, we're working with time and time is already abstract. So that's just, I mean, maybe that's why, you know, gorillas, apes, they, they can't understand music or hear it or brain process it, I guess. Um, from what I understand, maybe I'm wrong uh, about that, but uh, I, I think I'm pretty sure I read almost positive. I read a study uh, about that that certain intelligent animals have a hard time recognizing music or hearing music, um, which is weird. Oh, interesting! I didn't I, I didn't know about that. Yeah, no, I it, it's something I came across uh, somewhat recently, um, and I was kind of blown away by it. But I don't that know. Is, that is very interesting. Yeah how rooted in science it is now that I think about it. I'm like, I don't know how much, you know, bibliography uh, looking to it that I, uh, I did, but it definitely is actually a pretty common study. If you Google it, it pulls up pretty quickly. Oh, um, interesting. But uh, there is a, um, another thing that, uh, oh, I was going to say when it came to painting, um, like the ability to understand how to paint something and put something on a page, um, you know, relative to our ability to interpret music. Um, and that the more these animals will be able to understand art, the more be able to understand music. Again, that was a theory uh, that some mm -hmm. guy, I, you know, this is not very valid stuff that, at this point, but um, it, it, it just speculation, some guy on YouTube, <laughs> but it, it had a lot of good points. I, I thought, I thought it's to be kind of interesting uh, as to be, you know, how, like you were saying, how we connect to it um, and to words that, you know, certain lyrics imply. Um, for me, like Marcy Playgrounds is one of those bands. Like um, my, uh, my wife, uh, I introduced my wife to Marcy Playgrounds uh, and she had actually uh, really just like loved that band and just kind of got, sucked right into um you know everything that they had other than that one popular song <laughs> uh which in my opinion kind of sucks compared to their second album their second album's amazing um no offense to sex and candy or marcy playground but that's that that song isn't really that great in my opinion their first album their second album the third album are all awesome minus just that one song for me <laughs> um i uh every time i hear that band now uh, their album shapeshifter it's tough and i love them as a band but now i make that correlation to my wife who passed away which is really i'm sorry to hear that oh it's okay thank you uh for the condolences it's it's always hard to you know bring it up because i don't know it's like i don't want blindside people with it but it's a uh, it's something that you know counseling wise i'm supposed to bring up frequently and talk about it as much as possible so mm -hmm. try to trust in those mental health professionals you know sure. uh, but uh you know with music specifically um that 
those songs, Marcy Playground, like I, it just brings me back to times that experience with her, which is tough because I don't want to stop listening to that band. I love those mm-hmm. songs. Yeah, but it can be hard to hear a couple of them. Uh, because yeah, I understand. That's the, the connection that you'll make with it. But mm-hmm. I think that that's really a wonderful thing at the same time. Mm-hmm. Because the way I feel isn't necessarily sad. It's, and I'll cry sometimes, right? It'll hit me like that, like a ton of fucking bricks. But the yeah. difference is, it's like, it's almost that you feel that connection to that person that you lost. You feel that connection to that moment and really feel it. Maybe some people don't have that same experience uh, with music. Hell, some people can't actually hear and register music. Uh, it's like some sort of like audible dyskinesia or something like that. Auditory wow. dyskinesia, I think it's called. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, and they can't like actually hear music, which is just super depressing to me to think about. Because I don't know what I would yeah. do with my life without it. Um, so yeah I, I just say I think that there's something really maybe even extra dimensional about it at least for us as human beings um, what do you th- do you think music is limited to us entirely because I mean it, we, we we're reliant on a medium for it to work in right it's gonna be water or air for us to really for you to be able to hear music, uh, some sort of medium. So, I mean, I want to, uh, it's just, now I'm just, you know, tangent uh, thinking now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, uh, I think our minds are structured in a certain way to, to interact with, with, uh, with reality and that, um, any mind that's like similarly structured, let's say would probably uh, like appreciate it, but like, you know, you could make the argument that uh, that animals like have similarly structured minds, maybe not as sophisticated or advanced. Um, and like, if that study is true that they can't uh, recognize or appreciate music, then I don't, uh, it's a little worrisome when it comes to like uh, extraterrestrial, you know, communication yeah. and stuff. You'd almost want yes. an extraterrestrial civilization to be able to recognize the beauty in art and like. Whereas, yeah. if mathematics is universal. When you think music would have to also be universal? Um, um, well, I don't know. I, I yeah, mean, that's tough because it does music because, rely because on media. It, it, pro- it probably is, but the, the the point is like um, like for instance, even if math is universal, like you know, dogs can't do math as far as I'm aware. So it might right. just be one of those things. Like just because it's universal doesn't mean it's universally accept, uh, accessible. Um, yeah. yeah. No, no, that makes a lot of sense. It's like uh, you can have universal information doesn't mean everybody can access it. Like we yeah. have the, the internet's available to everybody, but yep. people in third world countries may not have a device to yep. access it. So yep. yeah, that, that concept of, of, uh, of um, information takes a lot of different forms uh, in how certain beings can even process information. Like we're almost processing it like a computer at this point, uh, right. human beings, uh, it's very weird how it's kind of like paralleled itself with binary data and how we've kind of gotten used to reading letters and, and mm-hmm. using reading as a primary form of communication versus just visual sight and, you know, hand language speaking, uh, reading visual communication has become really kind of predominant when it comes to, um, the education, I would say, um, mm-hmm everything we're learning is passed down from other people <laughs> you know the people who decided it for us in the past <laughs> you can verify it if you want to read but i'm not a big fan of reading I'm just gonna, <laughs> that's like people in america they're like i read my constitution you didn't read your fucking terms and conditions <laughs> bullshit <laughs> you, you didn't you didn't sign off on that facebook app if you did you wouldn't have mr small government american <laughs> it's like i don't want government i don't like people spying on me i don't like the idea of big tech signs the terms of condition on this facebook yeah, right. <laughs> it's just like unbelievable hypocrisy yeah. at its best yeah. i um <clears throat> i uh i definitely i definitely think that um as time goes on uh we and if we do make some sort of connection to some extraterrestrial who knows in the next couple months 
It's been a crazy last year. Who knows what 2021's got in store for us? Um, but if we were to make connection with some sort of alien, I mean, Sagan, they sent out that uh, that disc there, right? That had a record, this golden record. Uh, and then like that whole math equation in the picture of on Voyager, was it? They put it on Voyager, the first Voyager? I yeah, I think so. I'm not uh, sure either. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that's somewhere in in the back of my data storage there. Uh, <laughs> I um I think that if we are on that point, uh, I think it'd be great to show them music and not us blowing ourselves up with bombs, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Just a, just a outside thought. And on that note. <laughs> I think that's a good way to end an episode of Abstract yeah. Transmissions. <laughs> Music, not bombs. <laughs> yeah, right. Peace, love, and uh, you know, technology through the yeah. way of uh, Procrustus. <laughs> Or not. Let's hope not. Yeah, maybe not the first. Well, <laughs> Neuralink. We'll, we'll take small steps. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm still, you know, I'm I'm battling that because it's part of me that's like, maybe we should have a maybe we should have that that advancement. Yeah. If our time's finite here. Yeah. I want to thinking uh, Plan B is for humanity and space travel seems a little bit of a rough ride for our smushy bodies. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. I, maybe well, not in the way it's described in the book but <laughs> yeah no right right well i know in the book it, 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 but i mean i think that we we were great, great through frustration we find our way through you know um and uh i think it's very likely that we could get to that point um and uh yeah i just hope that we don't blow ourselves up first <laughs> I, I join I, you in that hope <laughs> <laughs> well here's to the continuity of human civilization and as yeah. uh as uh, always we appreciate the listeners out there uh and um and uh we'll try to edit this so it's uh, a little less choppy because i know there's a little visual drops there uh, but for the folks out there listening on the audio pro- platforms uh we're going to uh go ahead and uh, change a few things around uh, so there might be a few ads in the next couple of uh, episodes but uh there'll be volunteerism ads we're not getting paid for them uh we're just offering our opinions on things we like so it might be a little jarring and cheesy sounding i don't know <laughs> but as always uh you know uh, thank you so much for coming on the show today um and uh i'd like to do this again if you time to come on the show again uh yeah sure and, i really enjoyed uh join uh, joining you and thanks for having me it's uh, it's been a pleasure your brain is very very intriguing and i would love to talk more about this stuff it's been a, <laughs> sure. a real fascinating uh conversation back and forth and uh i think you know really kind of embodies the way we should be using technology so um i think the listeners out there and we thank you for coming on today uh and uh, as always folks uh, be kind to your fellow human being because as divisive as things can get we haven't dropped bombs on each other yet and so uh, as always we love your support Abstract here, abstract. Abstract transmissions.